Hashem told you to dance in a tango contest? A dancing teacher wants to tango with you? No! Critics are raving about Tango Shalom. It's clever and inventive, with bright chemistry on and off the dance floor. <laughs> A, a funny and thoughtful family film with a warm heart and a playful spirit. From the director of My Big Fat Greek Wedding. Oh, there's my friend Nando. Tango Shalom. In select theaters this weekend. Greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder, and, uh, you know, a guy who has a movie in theaters. <laughs> How often can you say that? Robert Meyer Burnett, and this is Midnight Metal episode 43. But you know what? It wouldn't be an episode of Midnight Metal without my cohort, my old friend, my partner in crime, and many other titles I can hang on in, but I won't tonight. Mr. Dave Parker. Dave, how are you tonight, and are you feeling metal, Dave? Rob, I am metal. I am excited. I am lubed up for tonight's show. Wow, Dave, you're lubed. You know, that's great you're lubed up for tonight's show. I'm rude, lubed, and tattooed. (laughs) Uh, You know, I got to tell you, Dave, I I, got to tell you, I I just got back from the movie theater. What would you see? I, I, did, again? I, I did see my own movie, Tango Shalom. And oh. since we're going to talk to our uh, esteemed guest later about filmmaking and the state of horror and all kinds of things, I have to tell you, I had a very interesting experience tonight. Do tell. Well, <clears throat> you know, for five years, I built this movie from the ground up. And every time I've looked at it, every single time, I was looking at it as a work in progress. There was always things I wanted to tweak things I wanted to change, and I was looking, always looking at it with like a clipboard in hand, uh, mm-hmm. making notes. And I realized, I went to this movie theater tonight, uh, I went to the Landmark and, and the, at the West Side Pavilion, and right. a lot of friends were there, family was there, it was pretty neat seeing Tango Shalom in Theater 1 and Shang-Chi in Theater 2 right next to each other on the marquee. But Glorious! It was, it was very interesting because, here's a movie I know every inch of, I knew everything about this movie. But when I was watching it t- today, it was the very first time in five years that I watched this film as a film, and I wasn't watching it as somebody who was making the film because there was nothing I could do. So I actually sat down, and for the first time ever, it seems weird to say this, I watched it from beginning to end as a movie. I let it sort of wash over me. Now, I've looked at it a, a hundred million times. But I've always looked at it with this, uh, the from the perspective of there was always something to do, to it, something to change, something to improve, and this was the first time that I ever actually sat down and watched it with different eyes. And I have to say, I liked it. It was really weird. Oh, I, I, you think well, that you good. have nothing more to learn about about a movie that you've worked on, literally, that you've built from the bottom up, um, and it was it was a it was a very enjoyable experience, and I. To be honest, I don't think I ever really liked the movie as much as I did watching it with an audience uh, of of paying customers and people that hadn't seen it before until tonight. So it just goes to show you, Dave, there's always something more you can learn, even about your own work. Absolutely. And, you know, that's something that I always have a hard time doing with is just sort of letting go and being able to just watch the movie, even with an audience. The director, yeah. it's, it's very difficult. And I think it's difficult for any artist who puts their work out there and everything that they've toiled away on for so long. But I think the thing that I really took from what you just said that is really interesting and really important and and, and so important to the sense of us 
working very hard as a society, as a culture, as a, as a human race is getting back to that experience because right now you just spoke to the, the importance of seeing a movie collectively instead of just seeing it in your living room with your family or friends, mm. it's not the same experience. And to be able to hear other people react to it can become infectious. Uh, you know, I, you know, we've been to many movies where we've felt that. I mean, obviously the Marvel movies, like Endgame, you could hear a pin drop during that movie. Everyone was so invested in, in, in and Infinity War as an example. Oh, those are but, two well, wonderful experiences at the movies. But then something like Paranormal Activity, the first one, the energy of the audience is what makes that movie really, yep. really, truly work. That 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 collective, it's the collective tension. So you know, I think I think what you said is really important about the movie going experience and and why it's so special and why we why we love it. It's funny tonight uh, before the show, I was just talking with a couple friends of mine. And they were just at the Hollywood Bowl seeing John Williams. Yeah. And again, they were just saying what a great, amazing experience it is to be able to celebrate the man and his music. But also uh, David Newman, I think, was the co-conductor. Mm -hmm. And he started out playing some Max Steiner stuff because wow. his dad, Alfred Newman, who was a uh -huh. composer, knew Max Steiner. And so they started playing a lot of very old Hollywood stuff. And they played things from Casablanca and, you know, a lot of his, I, I can't remember all. I know they played Lawrence of Arabia. They played a lot of things. Lawrence of Arabia was a Max Steiner, I don't believe, but, but it's still, it was like, no, it's Marie classic, right. They were playing like, just classical, you know, Hollywood music. Um, but again, it's collective. It's that collective experience, which is what I think seduced us originally by going to the movies, you know, to begin with books and stuff that we fell in love with, you know, comics, those things, those are very insular. Yes. Um, which is why, and they have a very important place because they spark the imagination uh, in a different way than say movies or television do. But movies are a unique thing where, uh, you know, it is that collective energy that I, I think the, that feeling that really makes the, the most in significant moments in your fandom really really matter because it's that it's that group feeling that group yeah. energy well especially like a comedy you know <clears throat> it, it's so funny working on it's it's difficult to convey to somebody what it's like to work on a film from the ground up for so many so long um it's 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 you you can't really explain it because it's not like it, it's so much of it happens in your mind you know, even though you're, hard, you're putting it together. It's hard to quantify that, especially yeah. and voice that to other people who uh, who don't, who haven't worked in the film business. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, and and <clears throat> they should be able to, excuse me, enjoy the movie for what it is. But yeah, what, what's but funny to me. It takes on such a significance when you put so many years into a project. Yeah. But for me, the, this is such a weird thing because, you know, it's a comedy and I, you, you're constructing jokes and you're trying to make things land, but I'm so far removed from whether it's still funny. Like, I just, you know, you know that your work is good. Like, I know that my work is good in the movie, but I don't, because no one's seen it, like, you, you know, I, I haven't watched it with people. You forget that you've made a comedy, even. So to right. me, it's like everything is about, okay, it's a story. We have all these things. And, and this is why a great script and great actors are so important because they you just take it for granted that these great actors and the performances you're crafting, the jokes will land because that's where your script and your acting is so important. And if you understand that, so I, it's been a long time since I have heard people laugh at this movie because we just haven't shown it to people. And I was surprised. There was laughter throughout the whole movie. And when you make a comedy, if people don't laugh, you failed. And it yeah. was a lot of fun, you know, watching it with people. And they laughed at things that I didn't even ever know were funny. And things that and have become funnier because we've lived through a pandemic. 
Yeah, and the, the fact that they're laughing, and these are people that you don't know who are politely laughing to show their support of you. Right. They're just they're just being genuine. They are just genuinely enjoying the movie. They don't know that anyone who worked on the movie, well, you probably stood up at the beginning and said, "Hi, I'm Robert Burnett. I helped make this movie." I did not. Before, and please enjoy the show. You can I did go not. up at the, at the front of the theater and go, "Hi." No. No, um, you know, I didn't want to turn that. off your phones. No, I'm, yeah, just, no, I didn't, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Well, yeah, but I mean, I didn't want to <laughs> say anything because I didn't want people to like, I, you know what? That would skew the experience. And and I think well, that yeah, I, I think it's not a lot of people that were there knew who I was, of course. But there was I have to say, do you know who came out? And uh, kudos to her. Connie, Connie Sang, who who uh, oh. and she was first of all, I'd never met her in person. I wouldn't have known what she looked like what? and. First of all, she's cute as a button, and uh, should she's we, who, who, how should we should we call Connie the the mistress of uh, the Sonic mistress? I mean, she provide she's provided with you know you me Scow John John ways Campia to, ways to hear things better. I like that the Sonic mistress. There you go, Connie the Sonic mistress. That's pretty cool. We have to have the Sonic mistress saying the God the Sonic the saying. <laughs> um, the she was, she the was very she was very delightful. She was definitely somebody you and I would would definitely be friends with and hang out with. She was very very cool, and um, uh, it's funny she said that you know I invited her out to dinner. I said hey come out with us, and she was joking about well maybe she wasn't joking talking about having social anxiety. And I'm like no no no. And then she finally said well look I got this great gaming monitor that's been delivered at my house and I got, I got it home and, <laughs> and I'm like, you are, I was like, Connie, you are one of us. You yes, are Google one of us. Gobble. A new, Google gobble. A one new of us. gaming monitor. I'm like, babe, you are right down. You are so metal. It was metal. You're metal as fuck, Connie. If you're watching the stream, you are. And it was just a delight. And you know what? She saw the movie twice this weekend. She went and saw it in Encino and she came and saw it at the landmark. So I want to thank you, Amazing. Connie, uh, for doing that. It means your support means the world to me. And uh, thank you again. You continue to support this channel and and my work. And and that was very very sweet of you to come. And yeah, very uh, cool. you you hey, have Rob. nothing to be socially anxiety about. Anxietous. Yeah. Anxietous. She's delightful. I, we'll party I, with her. She's the sangstress of sound. The the sangstress. That's like Jimmy Sangster, the director of. Uh, no, he was a writer mainly. Yes. Jimmy was a writer mainly That's of true. Hammer That's films. That's true. That's true. She's the sangstress of sound. The sangstress of honey, the sangstress of sound. <laughs> Are we going to exsanguinate her? Um, no. I hope not. Hey, Rob, you know what everyone's saying? I look like a Cree uh, with my you, lighting. I really do. Your lighting looks great tonight. Your lighting is on I, point, I, Dave. I'm feeling a little blue. No, Am not. I blue? I don't think you're blue tonight. God damn it. I think you're fucking no. metal as fuck, Dave. I got to say, I'm I really enjoyed our... boy, blue. I really enjoyed our conversation about Iron Maiden's uh, album. Iron Maiden's. Yes. Yeah. Uh, very exciting. But uh, yeah, I mean, th to me, that seemed like... I, and I, I wanted to jump on to talk about that last night. And then, you know, uh, help plug our friend, Jeffrey, who's coming on in a, a short little while here. But... um. Yeah, man, uh, that felt like the most significant metal thing that happened this week, at least as far as I know. But oh. I'm, I, you know, I'll, I'll admit it, guys. I'm not totally in the loop, and there are times when I get busy with work, and I haven't had a, much of a chance to do a deep dive on, on certain music stuff uh, this week that I normally like to. Um, but there is, uh, there's a. Uh, Ice Nine Kills, which is a, a band, they have a they have a new single out too, which is a, um, it's sort of a Chucky based uh, song. Uh, Ice Nine Kills, uh, they do uh, they do songs that are all like sort of horror based, which is certainly my jam, and they're like yep. you know very metal, um, and they're cool. But they have they have a new song out that uh, so they've got a new new album I think they're working on and. Uh, that's pretty good but you can find that on uh youtube uh and it's definitely a, a chucky based uh child's play based uh song and they do things that are always sort of horror based they did one that was sort of american psycho recently as well so yeah that's a lot of fun i would say check that out yeah uh that's uh i'm right there with you uh that's cool 
But yeah, you know, it's it's Dave. We've lived we lived through such a it, it, <laughs> the times we we're live in are so living, odd. We're still we're we're still living it. I mean, yeah, that's we're still. It's, I, I still, you've you've gone to the theater more in the past week than I have in the past year. I just haven't gone, and and I there's the there's that's the thing. Um, I don't. I'm not like a nervous Nelly. Um, I don't really relish being in a pack theater right now. I'll say that, but. I think I could go to a couple theaters where I wouldn't um, have to worry about it. But there are things like I want to see the new Candyman. Yeah. I hear, I hear really good things about it. And I desperately want to see Shang-Chi. And I have to look, I'm going to have to put, you know, my health on the line to see Shang-Chi. I mean, you really need, he, I need to go see an IMAX. Uh, you he's know, been, uh, he's, that character has been a part of my life since the 70s. I know. Since I was a wee, a wee little one. A wee lad. A wee lad. And, yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, because I have to, because, you know, since they're doing Shang-Chi and it's the 70s and everything, you know, I, look, I could miss it. There could be a Man-Thing cameo in there. And, you know, I could miss it if I don't go to the theater. But it's just a wonderful movie. You know, <laughs> it, I, I, I really, I loved it. Uh, I think it's a great film, especially, you know, growing up and watching wuxia movies and, and I, I, you know, uh, Chinese fantasy films i've loved them since i was a kid i mean i remember watching uh big trouble in little china and being like yeah like this is zoo warriors of the magic mountain or whatever and it's, which is exactly it's... what carpenter referenced too he 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 picked that movie out especially. specifically yeah yeah and yeah. and i and i i think that you know it's really interesting because uh you know a lot of people there's been a lot of divisiveness about marvel marvel's definitely in the midst of a fanboy backlash i think in a way and Which I, I don't get. I, I, I don't. I, I think they're sorry. I, no, I don't get it either. And I, I, you know, there there are people that I really enjoy that I like a lot that that are are coming down pretty hard on Marvel lately. And and I have to say that that uh, Shang Chi is not a movie that suffers from some kind of woke agenda. It, mm -hmm. It's a film that is really steeped in Asian fantasy cinema and martial arts. And you can look at the, D, the you, you can see if you grew up watching these movies as I did the the DNA of, of Shang Chi it, it it's it's just like I've said it's wildly entertaining I was talking about this last night I I've compared it to to Back to the Future and people are like wait what yes you know and I said it's the the way that every scene in Back to the Future was just entertaining Shang Chi is that way. It, it, it starts out it, it's very unexpected like when you're watching it, it I when I watched it, I was like. This movie's starting this way, and it's just very unexpected. And I found the movie wildly entertaining. And I, I guess it's a mindset. You know, it's a mindset you have to put yourself in, and it's just beautifully made and beautifully conceived. And I, I, I loved it. You know, I think the thing is with the with the the backlash and everything. I, I mean, I don't think Marvel's worrying about it, especially that since it's looks like they're having a hell of a hell of a good weekend considering we're still like oh knee deep and knee deep in the in the shit as uh as uh clarence williams the third would say in <laughs> tales from the hood well I, I think that what's great about it is um it's just good people people are going to see the movie and and they're loving it <clears throat> you know and and word of mouth gets out it's just dude i gotta tell you it is a you and i have seen we are uh, Dieter Bastian, who old? I stream with, no, no, he's we a trash old? panda. He likes he Dieter Bastian. Oh, I, can watch. I like my crap. I like well, that's my the crap thing. You and I, you and I have a very broad base of cinematic knowledge, and we are not above liking things that we know are are, are crap, but they are. Uh, we like it, you know. And they're I, my and crap. I think, they're my crap. Yeah, but I think that like this film, you watch this film, and it's just a wonderful. It's a one. If this movie was not. A Marvel Cinematic Universe movie, and if this movie, you know, had come out, I don't know, in like 1995 or something, it would have been people would have said it was a straight up bona fide classic. But the fact that it's the 25th MCU movie, dude, there's there's as many Marvel movies now as there are James Bond movies, and James Bond began in 1962, so it's taken. 60 almost 60 years to get to 25 bond films we've had 25 marvel movies in 13 years sure. and 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 it's pretty amazing and the quality of them and what's so funny is 
I think they really serve, in, in terms of being adaptations, they're not slavish adaptations of the comic books, but you can't, you can't do that. But no. it, they're, it's still, <laughs> like, you look at them collectively, and while, while even, even when it first started, people forget that the Marvel films were all over the place. You know, Thor, Iron Man, Captain America were different kinds of movies, and then they were all starting to work together. But now that we've had the whole Infinity Saga, I think everyone's looking for uh, uh, Black uh, Black Widow like Spider Man Far From Home was kind of a post post postscript to what we'd seen. Yes. So to me, Shang Chi is <clears throat> and, the f- and, and... go ahead. Sorry, well, Shang Chi is. is really the first film of Marvel Phase Four. And, right. and a, a new character establishes new lore, a lot of, especially when you get to the end and all that, very intriguing things about the universe. And mm-hmm. to know that it's being followed up by the Eternals, which is directed by our last Academy Award winner, and right. the buzz on the street is that the Eternals is not just a great Marvel movie, but it's just a great goddamn movie, period. And if oh, nice. I, I think what's <clears> going <throat> to happen in it there's going to be some very interesting ethical and moral conundrums uh, in Eternals, if I know my lore. And I, I think that, you know, obviously, Falcon and Winter Soldier, Loki, What If, and WandaVision were really interesting experiments. To me, it's like Dude, reading a bunch of limited the, series. They swung, they swung wide. Yeah, they each did. Each one of those in, a very, in, in very different ways. And you got to... I mean, you should at least respect that, whether it's your cup of tea or not, whether you like it or not, that's fine. What I would say is what Marvel is at least theatrically doing. I mean, one, Black Widow, Black Widow is like a postscript. It was something that should have happened before Endgame. That movie yeah, should no. have been before. Well, I, you know, I, th- I, I think I, everyone would agree with that because it feels, it feels and it's a good movie and and i like david harbour is fantastic in i love i, I thought it was it. it's not it should have come right after civil war you know but it's yeah, set after civil it feels, war right exactly so it feels like they were making up for like oops we 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 got a little ahead of ourselves and we messed up but with shang chi and the eternals one who would have ever thought they would have done a big budget shang chi movie no one. one no dude one. no who re- who remem- one who remembered the eternals the fact that they're doing these two movies to me seems like we are going boldly forward well that's a, a that's very what i know different way and that should that should get people excited because the uh, thing is you're still getting spider-man you're still getting doctor strange you're still getting thor we're still getting those but they're but that's the thing they're boldly moving ahead and opening new ground that could still have those characters that we've known and loved for 23 movies to come into that new, this brain brave new world, Marvel's brave new world. And I think that's really, that should be for people exciting because again, why do you want the same thing over and over again? Well, I mean, look, somebody in the uh, Bobo Yogi says, I, I saw Shang-Chi yesterday, eye candy, but the story blows. <clears throat> How does okay. the story blow? I, 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 I'm I, like, a lot of people are saying, I don't know what that means. I I thought the story was, was great. And in a way, to equate it, like, I, I'm a huge fan of Guardians of the Galaxy 2. And I thought that that was a film that was about fractured families. You know, yeah, you had... Come on. How can you, you- how can anyone really hate Guardians of the Galaxy two because Kurt Russell's in it? End of story. Well, yeah, but I, I mean, I, Sorry. I, 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 I have to say, <laughs> I have to say that I, I think that, again, I think Marvel uh, does not get nearly the credit that they deserve for doing the things that they do. The fact that they're making Shang, they're following up Shang Chi with the Eternals. I mean, again, you know, I hate to say it. But I think a lot of the audience is missing because all they know about wuxia movies is Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. I mean, I would. Uh, yeah, but that's the thing. Like, what, I, I don't we're, expect we're, everybody we're to know odd, these things. We're but odd, we're odd ducks that we happen to happen to know all this stuff, and you know, and even know cinema that goes back from yeah the seventies. But fact that Dave, we, you know, I, I would I, say I, that. But you and I grew up. I mean, I used to believe, like, I, I've told this story before. 
in the wake of Star Wars, there was a lot of of books that film books that came out about the history of fantasy, science fiction, fantasy, right. and horror. There was a book called Sci Fi Now by a guy named Alan Frank, which I still have here. Okay. That book was was it was an overview of of science fiction, fantasy, and horror cinema from the dawn of the cinema age. When I read that book, I think it came out in seventy eight. I looked at it. I'm like, I am going to see every movie in this book. But you're not oh, duck, Rob. Only, but but no, 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 no. Because, dude, when we were growing up, we did not delineate whether movies were old. It, universal horror, we'd watch it. No, Hammer horror, no, we'd no, watch course, it. We would never. I still, but I, but I th- but I think I think the generation and I, and I could be speaking out of my ass, guys. And I don't I don't know exactly know, but I think the generation that. Um, uh, started with the the internet generation. They've gone and they've gone and their 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 interests have gone to other things. Uh, yeah, we, that, yeah we, you're we, absolutely we might, right. We might we might have been the last sort of cinema total cinema generation. Well, because that's all we had. Now, that's all. Look, that's and, and other I things are like, dude. That is a fair point because if I was growing up today, my jam would be video games. I mean, video hmm. games are providing narrative the same way movies do, but like sprawling epic. Ghost of Tsushima. Look, when Grand Last Theft Auto us, Five, you know, yeah, I mean, when, when, I, when Grand Theft Auto Five came out, I was like, I had to play, I, I, I play the entire story. Uh, I loved it. The first video game, Uncharted, the first Uncharted. When Amazing. I got the first Uncharted, I, I have never in my life. I sat down. I played that from beginning to end. I, I, I think I played it for almost twenty hours. Right. And I was so captivated by the characters in the story. That's I love the way and I, I love the gameplay. And again, different different because the the character quote unquote performances were not as good. But uh the first Resident Evil, when I played that and when I was playing it and I got a jump scare out of it, I was like, Oh, this is a whole new level yep. of of what this is, and this is just the beginning. Yeah, and, and the and, thing uh, is and, and you know, Black Black Phillip brought up a very good point. Haters are going to hate. And now we, we're just conditioned. We are just in this world now where uh, people, it's a, it's a very weird thing to me. And I don't understand it, that people look for things to be upset about or hate or get angry about so they can complain as if that, as if complaining and bitching and moaning is the validation that they want from the internet. And to me, it's like, wouldn't you rather have validation from praising things and like going, Oh yeah, man, I agree with you. And also, uh, I just got to quickly because, uh, uh, hungry boy was like, Dave, many of us love this shit from 1979. Yeah. You know, I've loved this shit from even a little longer back, but, uh, I'm with you, but yeah, it's just like, I get, I mean, again, people are bringing up points. It's profitable to complain. I guess they get more views, but what's the, you know, I can't get too philosophical because we could be here all night talking about this, but I don't, I don't understand. And I never have the, as far as the, the, since the beginning of the internet, the, the, the trolling and the things of taking people down and, and pegging them down. It's like, to me, it's just like, well, just don't listen to those people. Don't watch whatever, whatever floats your boat. Well, I, 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 to me, we have like, I think, uh, you have, I should say this, what you called the post geek singularity, you have a lot of very passionate, intelligent people who are really open to all kinds of entertainment that you bring up because you're not just talking about movies and you're not just talking about, we're not just always talking about horror movies though. I know that's my jam, but the thing is, look, when I was a kid, when I just started really getting into, I watched everything dude uh look and, you know, I, and i love and i love things like witness with harrison ford as much as i you know like you know another harrison ford you know or or the big chill or anything i just love movies yeah well, well i would say this i mean me too i lo- love films by the way uh jeffrey is here but we can't see him so uh in our i don't know why but um i can't wait to bring jeffrey on to, to add him to this conversation but hmm. the um Here's what I don't get. Like, when I was a kid and and growing up in Seattle, we had sci-fi theater that was on Channel 11 every Sunday at 2 o'clock. And they would show 
all kinds of things. Like they would show, they showed a movie called They Came From Beyond Space. It's Michael Gow oh, yeah. who played Alfred in the Batman, Batman, uh, Tim Burton's is Batman movie. Is it Michael Gow Goff, or Michael Goff, Goff. It's Goff. It's is Goff, it Goff, Goff or Goff. Go? I always I, said Michael Go. It could I be my. I have no idea. Either way, this this movie is terrible, but I loved it. Like you know, I, another Michael Go movie that's great. If you would, I, I would, dude. I would watch. I mean, I love them, but I love the beginning of the end. Giant grasshoppers, you know, reptilians. Wait, wait, hold, hold, fucking hold, horrible. Hold, hold, wait, wait, pump the brakes, man. You just said them was about giant grasshoppers. No, no, no. the beginning of the end them is about is giant right. grasshoppers. Oh, the beginning of the end. Yeah. About, yes. Yeah, I love them. Them is so great. I am amazed they have not remade them yet. Well, I mean, yeah, and and, and the funny the funny thing was that if you were a kid, now here's something that I I would ask. Uh, uh, Jeffrey is here, I think, but okay. but we can't see him. Can you see him? Uh, uh no, Jeff, you got to turn on your uh, camera, pal. Well, he probably has. Oh, well, and I told him to use Google I, Chrome, so we can hear him. He is. I can't hear him. I don't see him either. I can hear him. Can you hear him? I can hear no. Jeffrey. Oh. Um, but, but, um, Jeff, try and click back on and off. Wait a minute. Should I, should I say Jeff or Jeffrey? What What is proper? Jeffrey. 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 Okay. Yes. Um, so here's what I what I don't what I don't get. Like here's here's what I think is is problematic now. Here's what I don't. Yes, uh, sir. I see him now. Now I see you. He oh, looks and I lovely. Can hear him too. You know what? I'm gonna. I just want to bring him into this conversation because you know I just uh, gotta say this. Michael Michael Go or Goth or whatever. How are we? I was the Gal. So I was always Gal. He's in so many. Jeffrey will weigh in on how to pronounce Michael Go's name. The guy who played Alfred in the Batman movies. Um, oh, he he's a writer. He's got to know how to pronounce that shit. People are bringing up like Conga. <laughs> just so. I mean, so many good, bad movies that are so much fun. That's why I love this audience because they know they're so shit. good, man. You help us out so much. It's true. Let me put, uh, I'm going to put Jeffrey into the center square. Circle gets the square and give him uh, a place, the place of honor that and right he in the middle deserves. Sandwiched in between. Uh, now, <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, Dave, you know, as we know, the double entendres fly around on the show. So I, I want to say one of the great things about doing Midnight Metal with you, Dave, is, is we've had some great guests on this show um we've had rock stars we've had other uh horror people uh and jeffrey reddick is a guy you know i've i've interacted with him for years nicest guy in the world he's the man who invented created the final destination franchise uh he recently directed a film uh back in well last year uh, he directed a film called Don't Look Back. Tamara, which I believe my ex-wife actually designed a video cover for oh, back right before um, he got divorced. <laughs> well, uh, or something. Uh, also, uh, Dead Awake. If I, Dead correct? Awake. Yep. Dead Awake. Uh, and then The Call. Jeff yep. was a producer on that one, which also starred uh, uh, Lynn Shea and uh, Tobin Bell. But he'll tell us all about his cinematic journey. I can't wait to hear it. So, everyone, I, I want you to put your hands together. Put your fucking fingers. Give me the devil horns, man. And as we welcome yeah. Jeffrey Reddick to Midnight Metal. Jeffrey, how are you? First of all, Jeffrey, are you feeling fucking metal tonight, Jeffrey, or what? Well, I've had about 30 tease so yeah i'm feeling pretty fucking metal right fuck now. yeah <laughs> you know what no one's ever said that on this show before so thank yeah. you for saying so <laughs> uh welcome to the show thank you for giving us your time sir uh of it's great to have you thank you so you know we were having uh, uh, let me let me just start off by asking you you this 
we were starting off, Dave and I were waxing rhapsodic about our youth and watching. As we usually do. As we do. Our, <laughs> our, our beginning our cinematic journey. When, could, first of all, give us, give us, set the stage. What did young Jeffrey Reddick watch? Were you reading comics? Were you watching horror films? What were some of your influences? Tell us everything. Everything. Um, well, I grew up in eastern Kentucky, uh, and we were very poor hillbillies. So I spent most of my time reading. Um, I started off really falling in love with like Greek and Roman mythology. Wow, okay. Uh, yeah, that, that was my first love. And then my couple of my friends got me into horror movies uh, when I was about 12. 12, I think. Really? That's when it started? Not so earlier. this was like big VHS. Uh, oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> so when they so you got you into... So you, oh, oh, sorry. Well, I was just going to so say... You when were, you were... All, All right, guys. Go ahead. You, you, you go. You go. go around. It's okay. Come on. Rob first. Uh, mm -hmm. Jeffrey, when you... when got, I would ask you, what what did your friends introduce you to? What were what were some of your gateway horror drugs? Um, The, you know, Friday the 13th. Um, yeah, they started with the hard stuff. Um, and when we, you know, we were young. So for us, it was really, I think the naughty factor of watching the movies. Uh, oh man, first, absolutely. And my mom at first was like, I don't know if I want you watching this, but then she's like, well, you're not out getting in trouble. So go ahead and do it. So she would like secretly like let us watch them, even though she bemoaned them until, you know, final destination that she loves. Love horror films right. That. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, then we started getting into it, like the makeup and started getting Fangoria uh, and really got into like what went into making, you know, horror films. And then comics came soon after that. I remember my first episode, our first episode, first issue of, of X-Men was like 167 with Dracula. So I right. Started, oh, oh, is that the is that the cover with Dracula and Storm? Yeah. Yeah. I horror. think that's I, an, that. I think that's actually an annual, though, isn't it? With Sienkiewicz's. Sinkev there was, a, there was an annual after that that came oh. out, but that was no. This was not. I remember this cover very well. I, I was so excited when I was reading X Men at that time, and they threw Dracula in there, and he so good. Storm and turns. I was like, Dracula was in the X Men. This is amazing. Yeah, my first issue was that, and then the next one was like Limbo. So it just it was like, oh, this these mutants are awesome, and there's a lot of scary crap going on in here. Um, yeah, no, I I I, I love. I mean, X Men to me, uh, the way I love Star Trek, I loved. I always thought that X Men is what what comics were the comic version of Star Trek for me. I love the whole extended family, and it was so crazy to have Patrick Stewart end up playing Professor X. So bizarre. Oh, perfect, yeah. yeah, but yeah. Um, so comics were big, movies were big. Parents yeah. were your mom was supportive. That's that's unique. I've heard a lot of people whose parents denied them horror. Uh, my mom, my mom was. You know, she's no longer with us, but she was pretty fucking cool. She passed away at 97, so she lived a lot of life. Wow. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, she uh, she married a black man before the civil rights movement. So she was definitely not, you know, somebody who tried to conform to what people said she should do. And in Kentucky. Did, Think yeah, about Kentucky, that, guys. Yeah. And when she found out he was cheating on us, she left his ass, which is women didn't do back then. Wow. Um, so, yeah. So she was she was a pretty... She was kind of the black sheep of the family because, um, yeah, she would let us do stuff. No pun intended about the black sheep. <laughs> um, <laughs> hey. No. Um, so, yeah, so she was she was supportive. Uh, when I told her, I mean, my big dream growing up was to be an actor. You know, so I, when, when I told her that, she was like, no, no way. I, you got to get a real job. You can't be doing the acting <laughs> stuff. So I told her I was majoring in science until... I got in my first play and I was like, Hey mom, um, kind of <laughs> idea. You want to come see me oh. in a play? So, um, so yeah, but this has been in my blood from, you know, for a long, long time. That's yeah. crazy. So, but, um, with that early on, uh, with what, what was the thing in horror that really like, that's what like, really got you hooked was it friday the 13th or was it uh, i know i know with you elm street yes is a very very big one so would that be the real one that like really like that was the hook that 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 you know pulled you in that yeah. one yes up, up until then it was more like oh let's watch it for the fun and gore and then uh 
Nightmare on Elm Street. I'll, and I, st it's a, I still remember the night because it was playing at a drive-in with a double feature of Alone in the Dark um, with Donald Pleasance and then Nightmare on Elm Street. And um, <laughs> we were too poor to go to the theater all the time. So we sat on my friend Tony on his dad's truck and like turned the CB on to the radio. Dude, and, that's the best. Oh, Come yeah. On. Oh, it's awesome. And uh, so we watched Alone in the Dark and I was like, oh, that was good. Had no idea what to expect from Nightmare on Elm Street. And the movie just fucking blew me away. Mm -hmm. like special effects, you know, a super strong final girl who's like on the case and after Freddie, like halfway through instead of standing up at the end of it. And Robert England just did such everything. That movie, I just love it. Love it, love it. And That's um, awesome. Yeah. So that's now, what made me fall in love like Love with horror. horror yeah with horror now no before that and after it uh people want to know this before we get into your vast filmography what are other types of movies that you unabashedly love like what are other kinds non-genre movies what are the other genres that you really love a lot that I love have inspired the, you i love fantasy uh superhero stuff i've always loved growing up uh comedies i i really will if there's a if, if the if a movie's really good i don't really care what genre it's in i love action mm. sci-fi I, I just i love movies but i agree with you yeah but when you work in the horror genre it's it's such a um overlooked kind of genre by the industry in a way uh and growing up i never wanted to be one of those people that was like this isn't a horror movie. It's a psychological thriller. I'm like, fuck you. It's a horror movie. Um, so God, remember that really... period of time when like, well, even you know, Fangoria misery was... really is a psychological horror. So is silence of the lambs. It's, yeah. I mean, it's about a guy who skins women and makes a soup, but that's psychological. Just uh, so Texas I, Chainsaw is psychological horror. You know, yeah. I wanted, I want to get back. Cause you brought this up. Fangoria used to just was merciless about going after people that called things psychological horror because so often, when they would interview filmmakers, uh, well, yes, this is psychological horror. I, I wonder, like you mentioned Fangoria, to me, Fangoria was something that was incredibly necessary. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was, it, it, you know, once it figured out what it was, the first 10, I was a huge Starlog fan, so when Fangoria was coming out, issue one had Godzilla on the cover. You know, and Star yeah. SU four had Star Trek the Motion Picture on the cover. I'm like, yeah, and R two D two and C three PO are on the cover of like six. But oh, by the time you get to what? nine and ten, you get up to Motel Hell, and then it's like, all right, yeah. now we're off to the races. But but I, I want to ask, how important was Fangoria to you? Were you like a Fangoria kid or a Famous Monsters kid? Fangoria. Um, Me I too. think it was also what was available because they sold mm -hmm. Fangoria. Um, at our video store. Oh uh, wow! Oh wow! But I <laughs> jinx yeah. Bob. And just you know, reading about Tom Savini and just how they did, you know, with his effects and all these other great people that were coming out of that period, um, it just made the magic of movies real to me. Mm -hmm. So it what didn't turn into this like ethereal thing that I could never be a part of. Um, I think it showed me the kind of behind the scenes stuff that really fascinated me too. You know, oh, it's it interesting great. that it's interesting that you mentioned that because it's funny that you mentioned like watching the movies and then getting interested in the makeup because that's exactly the path that I had, especially. And then after seeing the horror movies and then discovering Fangoria and then getting really into the makeup effects. Yeah. And I think for me, um, understanding the makeup effects made me less scared of the movies because I was so impressionable that anything I could it, like the trail the the tv commercial to friday the 13th would give me nightmares and i i shit you not i shit you not that's how impressionable i was and then understanding how the and and this is how i sort of got around it with my parents when they were like okay why is he why is he running all these horror movies this is kind of weird and I approached it with like, well, no, but th there's an art to this. There's the, the makeup and, and they do things. It's just like, and luckily my mother really did like the universal monster movies that she grew up with. Mm. So when I explained to her, it's like, yeah, but you see Boris Karloff was wearing makeup and that's what this is an extension of. And then they 
kind of were like okay with it. And it also helped me not be so, I was still scared by the movies, but not traumatized Yeah, where I would be before. So that's really interesting. You know what else? I would ask you this. One of the things that I loved about, say, the early 80s was the diversity. And when I say diversity, I mean diversity in storytelling. You had Cronenberg doing body horror. You had your slasher films. You had monster movies like American Werewolf and The Howling or Carpenter's The Thing. Horror was really diverse in terms of the kinds of stories that it was telling. And yeah. I I love that. I mean, I, I knew that like Cronenberg was over here doing his singular thing and John Carpenter was doing his thing and J- Joe Dante and John Landis and, and uh, lesser directors even. And was that... Was 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 were you more attracted to you said Nightmare on Elm Street because I I love the combination the Elm Street series was the perfect combination of 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 fantasy and and slasher horror but the whole idea of entering your dreams and when you get to Nightmare on Elm Street three which I think is one of the great sequels of all time just because Elm it's Street so, three the Dream Wars it's a it's a game changer it, it, it's it's just a it's such an imaginative film and the first movie that I'll, I I'll say this Rob but wait Dream Warriors to me that's the first X Men movie wow yeah. I never thought in of a that way, way in a way I looked at that movie as being like oh shit that's like the X Men. It's a team of yeah. kids with powers in a weird way. Well, I have to say, the first movie set I was ever on was Nightmare on Elm Street 5, The Dream Child, because oh my God. I, I, I was working on Leatherface as the art department PA, and they sent me to that set to pick up a bunch of shit and bring it over to our set. And I had never been on a real movie set before. And Which, it, they, which they set had, was it? It was, you know, where they were doing the the, the motorcycle scene. Oh yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yeah, that yeah. they were they were shooting. It was at the A one Globe Building, on the corner of Robertson oh, and wow. Venice, and and okay. uh, you know I had to go there and pick up all this stuff and fill up. It was my first day on the job, and you know they sent me there and and uh, I was like, this is the most amazing because our set wasn't built yet. You know, we're working in an office in Valencia. <laughs> I'm I'm like you know scared to death. And uh, I went on that set, and it was like the coolest shit ever. <laughs> like I'm looking around, going, "This is amazing!" <laughs> and you know that motorcycle gag, and and it, it was it was everything they promised me, everything I dreamt of. Working on movies was was right there when I walked on that set, and I was supposed to be there. I'm like, I'm here from. It was C.J. Strawn and her brother Mick was this production Mick, designer yeah. on Leatherface, so it's like. Yep, you're supposed to be here. All right, kid, what do you need? Pick up whatever you want. It was the best thing ever. But it was the it was the fifth nightmare movie, but but those fantasy sequences. I mean, is that what drew you to the Nightmare franchise, Jeff, Jeffrey was because it combined like obviously there was social commentary in two, there was all I I I think the Nightmare franchise never gets enough credit for how deep it really goes. It's not just a slasher franchise. There's so much more going on. Yeah, and I think it's again, it's the story and the villain are so unique that it that surprised me. Um, I, you know, thought Tina was going to be the lead. So when it flipped to Nancy, that's it. Just kind of kept surprising me. Yeah. Mm. Um, and I just I love the way that he blends his the dream world with the real world. So for yeah. me, like that really made me kind of fall in love with supernatural kind of fantasy horror, which me too, you know, is, is my favorite, but I, uh, again, will watch anything and often do just go through and see what horror thing is playing and be like, well, this looks like not so great. This looks like something I've, I wrote for <laughs> direct video 20 years ago, but I'll watch it anyway. Um, yeah, Jeff. Jeff consumes even way more crap than I do. I, it's like <laughs> we talk, and he's like, "Oh yeah, I bought this movie because you know the poster looked good." And I'm like, "Now I'm all like, are you kidding me, man? Unless I hear something like, if I hear, if unless I'm hearing some buzz, I, I, I ain't diving down that 
die on that road. But but Jeff is gonna die by the sword no matter I what. Know. Man. I I I just get <laughs> yeah. an itch and I need to you know. So I'm just like whatever's on, I'll buy it. Do you think that's you a, know, they a, have cr they have creams for that itch, you know? <laughs> Do you think that's a function of of the video store days where where you just rent shit you didn't know what it was because the box? Look, I mean, I think one of the great things about the VHS, the video video era, the home video era, when you go to... I worked in video stores for eight years. And I started when I was 13, actually, in eight, 1980, when very few movies were even available. But I would buy... The, I remember the... the What was the... Dave, what was the H.R. Giger, uh, the, the poster? Future Kill. Future Kill. <laughs> I, all you had to... This is, Guys, this is yeah, how you know what it means. You saw it you, I was like, when he you just knew goes, what it means. Dave, what's the HR gear? Is like, yeah, it's, you know, it's the future, hand, future, it's kill. future kill with with Marilyn Burns and uh, Ed O'Neill from Chainsaw. Yeah, dude. Which I mean, the poster is the best thing about that movie. But I think we all. Sure I would ask you. Him. I mean, Jeffrey, you you would watch anything, right? Like you'd any VHS, yeah, but, and so that's why, still to this day, you still do. Oh, I'm a creature of habit, dude. So yeah, I would um, I would read Fangoria to see what sounded interesting coming out. Yeah, yeah. But then also I'd go to the video store and just walk around and read the back of the bin, whichever poster looked good. You know, yeah. but the funny thing is now where I get a little more selective is because everything, so few things are like as good as the video boxes back in the day because everyone's a Photoshop genius. Oh. Um you know, so to me, it's like, yeah, they all look the same. And it's like I have to at least look at the trailer to see if I'm interested. Yeah. And then I can sort of tell, like, okay, this was made for, uh, you know, $25,000 in England somewhere. And I'm like, nah, I'm not going to do it. But but Jeff holds the torch of faith with this stuff. I'm like, he, I will do it, damn it. Then I'll call David. Like, yeah, and then I'm like, oh, thank God you saved me six bucks. <laughs> I'll wait till it's on Tubi. Yeah, but you TV want it to be good. It you want, want it to be good. You... I want. I want everything to be good. Me too. I want is, everything to be good. A, there was a magic. There was a magic about being able to go to the video store, or even like later on when we went to Dave's Laser or something. There was a magic to be able to go to a store and see the titles spread out, and you can just browse and look, and then decide you like read the. I'll tell you, funny story. I think I may have mentioned this before. But Sleepaway Camp, perfect example of a video box that did not entice me. You know why? Because when I turned it around on VHS, there was no photos in the back. I'm going, well, this, this is some <laughs> cheap, janky thing because they can't even show photos from the movie. So it took me a long time to rent that movie and actually watch it. And the movie is delightful. <laughs> well, I mean, look, we live in we live in. Uh, amazing times. I, the, I the... went. I, I dated and went out with Felissa Rose before I ever saw Sleepaway Camp. Uh, I, I would say we live between Scream, Arrow, you know, Kino Lorber, Mill Creek, whatever. We're now living in in the era where we're getting the best versions of all of these movies. I mean, Arrow's 4K Argento stuff oh, that's coming out. Wow. Dude. dude, dude, fuck that. Arrow doing Phantom of the Mall on Blu-ray. Bruh. It's coming. Well, Come know. on. Come on. And you I, know what? I'm still going to buy it, and I know it's crap. But it's Phantom of the Mall by Arrow. Dude, I'll, I'll buy anything pretty beauty, much that Arrow puts out. Beautiful. Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> you know, the DVD, but the DVD era the really mall. saved a lot of these movies. I mean, you couldn't get a, a decent... I remember the big sought-after uh, uh, bootleg VHS tapes was anything Argento. If you could get Suspiria, you were, you were the shit. And it was always like, well, that's that, cut. luckily, it was saved, that was saved by VHS, you know, at first. Well, no, come on, but man. Then, that three-disc set. But no, but no, no. I, and you know, uh, and funny enough, Rob, I'll remind you, that three-disc set came out on September 11th, 2001. No. Why? Why'd you have to go there, man? Why'd you have to harsh my because tonight? because that was the why'd one that? good memory I had. That was the one good memory I had of that day, and and it, and it's it's important to it's important to bring up because obviously it's a very important date 
and not to take away from the actual importance of it, but I, you know, because that day was so heavy and everything, I remember like going, I need a break from the news. Let's go to Dave's laser because Suspiria just came out. Dave, do you also remember since you brought this up, what was due to be delivered on September 11th, 2001? The usual, the, our usual suspects material. Our, 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 our uh, amazing documentary, if I can say. And I stayed up all night uh, yes. laying back the texted and textless versions of our documentary. And uh, yeah, that I have. A, I, I was, I, yeah. I was at the time, I, funny enough, was house sitting and taking care of Darren Scott's and Tony's dogs. And I was up to like 4 a.m. And then I woke up and uh, found out what was happening after uh, after I woke up. Jeffrey, what were you doing the morning of September 11th, 2001? No, I mean, I lived in Battery Park City, so I was like five blocks from the World Trade Center. Oh, my God. Yeah. So I got up. I (laughs) just um, no, I got up and I turned on the news and I didn't have the volume up so i wasn't processing what i was seeing because it just didn't make any sense and then my phone started ringing and my friends were like you need to get out of there right now so i went downstairs to find out what was going on and they were like you need to run so you were five (laughs) blocks from ground zero yeah (sighs) Yeah. like five of the longer blocks but yeah when the second tower fell like the smoke like rolled all the way up to like there was a glass walk over over Hudson Street, and I remember the that glass thing stopping some of the smoke from coming. But yeah, they Amazing. wouldn't let us get back down to our place. Um, it was about a week before we could go down and get stuff. Uh, a couple of days before that, they let us go down if we had pets. So I went and got my cat. Um, but yeah, it was. Uh, what was yeah, that like? That was a, I mean, I mean the whole experience. I, I mean, you're, not you to know, get into it. Like we're supposed to be taught being all metal tonight, but wow! I mean, I didn't well, know I think that. It's pretty fucking metal, yeah. Rea- um, reality, reality is metal. Reality is yeah. metal. Um, no, I mean, for me, it was just shock for a, a couple of days. Um, I also remember how the city, you know, really came together. Like people were helping each other, obviously in that moment, but yeah. Months after that, it was just like the city came together, the world came together. Um, and I don't think if this had happened in Los Angeles, that would have been the case. I think there's something special about New York and New Yorkers and everything else. I think if something like this happened here, it would be a free for all, everyone out for themselves. Unfortunately, I hate to say it. I don't think that there is that spirit in Los Angeles that would bring people together. I I just I just don't. New York's its own special because it it's so compacted you know you know with everybody yeah. living on top of each other so you do feel like when you're in new york city you're part of new york city like when you're in los angeles it's like oh it's beautiful here i love at los angeles but i don't you know and this is just my per, for me personally like i don't feel like oh i'm part of los angeles um, right but when i was in new york and i was also went there right out of college so i was i was much younger but you know i sp- i would have stayed if it hadn't been for 9-11, I was going to stay. Like, that's the only reason I moved out to Los Angeles. Right. Well, and I think also your career trajectory and the path that you set yourself on also brought you out here. So yeah. I'd love to hear, and I know everyone else would, it's like, so where do you where do you make the jump from being in New York? And were you working for New Line then and then jumped here to Los Angeles? How, how, tell us how you got here and how it worked its way up to final destination. Cause I think Mm. a lot of people would like to hear that. Well, it's a, I mean, I kind of have to start because new line cinema is, was, I worked there for 11 years uh, during the creative heydays of the studio um, in the early nineties when they were just making amazing movies. Did you go there because of nightmare? Uh, Yeah. Yeah. No, the funny, the funny story is, um, When I was 14, after I saw the movie, I went home on my typewriter and I banged out a prequel idea. Hmm. And I called information and I got the address for New Line Cinema and I mailed the prequel to Bob Shea. (laughs) Um, And he sent it back to me because it was unsolicited. Right. So I had to look that up because I didn't know what the hell unsolicited was. I was only 14. 
Um, and so then I sent it back to him and I'm like, look, mister, I've spent $3 on your movies. I think you can take five minutes to read my story. So he read it. Wow. And he got back to me. Yeah. And he was, he was very supportive. He's like, you know, you need to study more, learn about writing, but you have a great imagination. And so when I was 19, I went to New York to study acting and uh, Bob Shea's assistant, Joy Mann, uh, who had been staying in touch with me along with Bob over the years, said, hey, do you want an internship at New Line over the summer? And I said, yes. And I interned over the summer, but then I got an agent and then I was like, screw school. I want to stay here in New York. <laughs> um, <laughs> and yeah, I worked, Good at, man. I worked at New Line um, for 11 years and they, they produced Final Destination. I didn't leave. The funny thing is after I sold Final Destination, I stayed in New York because I'm like, oh, I can just write and keep my job because I have this weird thing of loyalty and weird because i grew up at new line so i just felt very comfortable there right and then after i sold the story story for the second one then my boss was like jeffrey we love you but it's time to go out in the world and be a real writer <laughs> i was like fine give me my severance package um and then yeah I, I left i think it was in july of 2001 and then or 2000 yeah that summer and then 9 11 happened after that so then after 9 11 i me and my roommate were just like let's just go to california wow i've been putting well, now, this off too. let me let me let me ask, okay so i i'm curious and you probably told the story a million times but but i haven't heard it so i'm gonna ask you right now it's the first time i'm sure rob so no so <laughs> you you started working at new line how mm. did you come to write tell us Tell, give, I love I love the process of how people accomplish things. How yeah. did you begin? What, what what started you on the path of of writing Final Destination, and how did you present it, and how did you sell it to New Line? Yeah, what was the seed that said, "Oh, this"? And I'm curious why you're telling the story. When you get to the actual movie. What differed from what you presented to where it became, where where it went to? Absolutely, uh, you know, working at the studio was was amazing. Um, I learned about writing by reading scripts and reading coverage. I found coverage of something I wrote in high school where they told me it was good, and I, the coverage was like, "This is a piece of shit." So I'm like, "Thank God I didn't read that when I was young." I, they, they didn't say that. They just said that that it wouldn't pass muster for an after school special. Um, Ooh, wow! Just, Did you keep that piece of coverage? No, <laughs> I, I, no. Um, <laughs> but I remember it. It's like burned in my brain, and it's like this was obviously written by you know a middle schooler, and I was like, I was in high school, damn it, when I wrote this. Um, but the lesson of that is, I'm glad they didn't tell me when I was younger. I would have been like, I can't do this. Uh, but no, I was working at New Line, still pursuing the acting thing. But honestly, in the early '90s, diversity and casting was not on anybody's radar so my right. agent was like you know got me a lot of background work and under five work but she's like you know they just don't write you know if you wrapped or play basketball you know i could get you auditions but there's nothing i can really get for you right now so then i was like screw it then i'll just write movies about teenagers getting killed and young people getting killed and then i'll star in it that was my master plan <laughs> so that's why i got into writing um and final destination came after many many scripts of mine got passed on by new line because you would submit it for coverage and if it got good coverage then they would kind of move it to you know the development team to see if there was interest uh for final destination the seed of the idea came from me reading an article when i was flying home to kentucky about a woman who was on vacation and her mother called and told her to switch flights she's like i have a bad feeling about the flight you're on so the woman switched flights and the plane apparently that she was on went down and I was reading this on a plane and I just put it in the back of my head. You know, that was interesting, something interesting. I didn't have a story for it. Uh, but when I decided to pursue acting or writing like full time to get an agent, they told me I had to write something like a spec script for something that was on TV. So I had to write a, you know, just kind of a free episode to show that I could write other characters' voices. So I used that idea as a setup for an X-Files episode. Wow. Um, I love that show. And it's ironically, we ended up having James Wong and, or yes. And uh, yeah, don't say James Wan different. I know. I know. I said Wong. And then I was like, wait, did I say Wong? I got to make sure. <laughs> um, 
so I wrote it and then the agent signed me, but one of my friends, uh, Mark Kaufman, who worked at New Line, um, it was like, this is a great idea. You should write this as a feature. Um, so a lot of this is, it's an interesting story because there's just a lot of pieces that kind of came together. Yeah, yeah. Right at that point, one of my good friends at New Line, Chris Bender, started to go work for the producers. Um, Chris Bender started to work for Craig Perry and Warren Zai. And he's like, hey, we're looking for horror ideas. So I sent over four of my ideas and they really sparked to Flight 180, as it was called at the time. Uh, I remember that. I actually, before it was made, I did get that script. Someone gave me the script and it was Flight 180. That's so funny. Yeah. Now, uh, let me ask you this. So what year what, around? Give me a, a time frame. What what year was this? Ninety seven, I think. Ninety six or ninety seven. Now, did you take any comfort from Mike DeLuca writing in the mouth of madness for Carpenter? Because, you know, he he very I, I met Mike DeLuca for the first time when I was a PA on Leatherface and um then obviously he he wrote working at, I I always thought it was really interesting that a guy working for the studio ended up writing a script for the studio that got made. Freddie's yeah, dead. no. I, one of the things I loved about New Line, and it it was kind of funny because so many I think it got that reputation, so a lot of people would work there, you know, <laughs> wanting to get scripts made. Uh, and uh, but no, I mean I think the biggest inspiration because I've been I had started writing it's a midi admitting stuff before the mouth of madness but i think the right just honestly the creative spirit of new line kind of really I, there i i can't think of another place like it you know that any other studio that's ever been like it before like no. especially at that time um so they were just very encouraging and creative you know they knew genre they knew they respected genre uh and again well, i and i i just knew that there was having worked there yes it gave me some advantages but it also because a lot of people working there wanted to make movies. It also was like, oh, here comes somebody else with another project. So I had a lot of projects passed on by them. So I decided right. that for this one, I would get producers on board who had a deal at New Line. And then I wrote a treatment. And originally it was all adult characters. It was more in line with Final Destination 2, where it was all adult characters that didn't know each other. And then Scream came out and then they were like, teenagers are hot so let's make them all teenagers i'm like all right cool so we kept changing <laughs> it but they kept bumping on the fact that we never showed death and they're like we just don't understand how you can have a horror movie where you can't see the villain and we're like that's the whole point like death is you know i and i wanted to keep death a force and not tie it into any specific cultural right. or religious belief or non-religious belief because death just is for everybody and that's what made and, it work um, that's what made it work. But honestly, that's that was our biggest stumbling thing. It got to the point where Craig Perry was like, well, if you guys don't buy it, we're going to take it to Miramax. And they're like, we'll buy it. <laughs> um, but yeah, they did try to figure out some ways to try to make death show up. Uh, luckily, when James and Glenn came on board, they were like, we are absolutely not showing death, which, you know, I think, again, made the movie what it is. Um, and so they fought for that as well. But even when the movie was coming out, I, you know, cause I worked in, in the New York office, they weren't really marketing it as heavy as they normally did, which was annoying to me. <laughs> I'm like, damn it. This is I can crazy. imagine. Yeah. But then it became a, like a word of mouth hit. So it didn't have the drop second weekend drop that most genre films have. It actually climbed and it did really well. And so they started pumping more money into to marketing it. Hmm. Um, to Dave's uh, question, um, how the finished film differs from my original script, it's basically Death's M.O. Uh, was a lot different in my, in my version because, again, I was very influenced by Nightmare on Elm Street and fantasy reality. And, and so my conceit originally was that since Death basically fucked up, I say I don't say fuck in real life, but then you get me on a podcast and I'm like, fuck, fuck, fuck. You can say fuck. Um, uh, it's it's metal as fuck here. Yeah, Jeffrey. fucking right, Jeff. You never fuck say yeah, fuck. Dude. Yeah, you're, you're <laughs> such, a, such a primrose you know, know. path it's, there. Please. It's an angel. Um, but <laughs> in hey, my Rob, movie, I saw you pour that. Fuck, 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 I saw you pour that, Rob. You know, you know, this is a sober show. 
Hey, dude. Oh, I, this I this is Zevia. <laughs> uh, yo, he poured it into the can. You can never tell. <laughs> hey, no, but zero Jeff, uh, calorie but Jeff, soda. Jeff, I want you to continue the answer, but what what I want to clarify is because I will say this, at least from my end, and we actually haven't talked about this, but a lot of the rumors spread around that when you wrote the script that you did have a physical representation of death as like a Grim Reaper sort of character. And now what I'm hearing is like, no, you never had that. You never wanted that. So was that something that, where did that rumor happen? Where did that come out? Was that like studio pressure to like, we have to hook onto a character? Um, well, I, I, I know there was one draft that I did where at the very end of it, like I had like the shadows kind of form into like a shape and vanish. Okay. But, it, it, but it, that was the only thing that I ever, that was the, the most that I ever gave them as far. There was never like a Grim Reaper. Um, yeah, I read a couple articles at the time that were like, oh, the original script had like a Grim Reaper. Yeah. Yeah. Sickle. So that's, that's that it, really from, interesting. That came from an interview with, you know, James Wong and Glenn Morgan actually, um, where I, they said it actually, which mm. that's kind of why I put this. Well, they're, they're on the crack. So that's fine. Who isn't on the crack? Me. I'm not on the crack. <laughs> Dude, Rob's I can't get crack. good crack. Not, no, Rob, no, no, no. Rob, Rob's I, not on the crack. He's there's not on no the crack. good MDMA. There's no good cocaine. There's no good crack. You can't. I, you know <laughs> what? I I buy hot toys action figures. That's his instead. crack. That's your, instead. That's yeah. what I. You know, I, it's I'm so off hard the for him not to melt them. You know, like to try to smoke them in some way. <laughs> no, snort them. You chop up the plastic and you. Anyway, you were saying, Jeff, before um, Rob interrupted you. No. <laughs> with his with his drug binge fantasy, yeah. Um, I know. I'm just giving you. I'm it's all about MDMA. Off. It's gonna be legal, okay. man. I can't wait. As long as I can get good MDMA again, I miss it. <laughs> You're so. too old now. You're too old, man. You're never too old for a good serotonin dump. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> no, but I, I think never, this is... at, our, at your age, at our age, you're never just too good for a good dump. I think. No, 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 dude. Sarah, come on. Anyway. No, this is a good question. Midnight right? Metal, sponsored by Me. Metamucil. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. We're not no. old. We're just seasoned. Oh, that's what I like. <laughs> we're, we're not old. We're just leathery. <laughs> I, would say, I would say we all look pretty good. You know, we're all like, we got nice skin. We're good, you know. We're not, I, I, I'm not sacrificing virgins in the basement and drinking their blood. Yet. You're not, because I am. I can't even find any virgins in West Hollywood. So. <laughs> well, <laughs> no wonder. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I do the other dark arts. Um, anyway, back to death. <laughs> back to death. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, my, my original conceit was that since death didn't kill them the first time, it couldn't just come back after them. So death basically manipulated each of the characters like guilt or something that they'd done in their lives until they killed themselves, yeah. which was pretty dark. Um, so even though they kept the kind of structure of my film, they, when James Wong and Lynn Morgan came up with the Rube Goldberg device, which I, I love and think it helps make the movie more universal and, and takes it completely out of something that I think horror fans would love and made it something that people that don't normally watch genre films love. Um, so in my version, like Todd and the guy that gets hung in the shower in my script rigs up a noose. And when his dad comes home, they're like having this frantic call on the phone because he's you can he can, you can tell Todd something is really wrong. So his dad is running home. And when he opens the garage, he ends up hanging Todd. So there's a lot of the remnants of my deaths in the movies, but definitely with the Rube Goldberg uh, veneer over them, which I think really, again, was a great great choice by james and Glenn. a very unique thing and and then obviously it was i mean i think final destination in a way was very much an inspiration for the saw series no i didn't even think about that because no, what, of the what? elaborate the elaborate traps and, oh, and yeah. all okay. that stuff is wow. very very much i think comes from the in the the inspiration i would say would come from the complex rube goberg Esque Final Destination stuff. Well, I know after it came out, everybody kept saying, "Bring us something else like Final Destination," and then I would come up with some other ideas. They're like, "That's too much like Final Destination." <laughs> of course, I'm like, well, I like I'm only the motherfucker who created it. Well, no, welcome to Hollywood. It's like bring us something that's exactly the same but different, but not too different, but not too close. And it's like, 
and you wonder why movies <laughs> are so hard to get made. Well, let oh, let I... me let me ask you this. I mean, I I I'm I am always optimistic about horror genre stuff. Horror can make money. I mean, we've seen a lot of like uh, A twenty three has their highbrow horror, whether it's The Witch or whether it's uh, uh, Midsummer or, or, you know, Avi, or was it Ari Aster's movies, Midsummer and uh, Hereditary, even though I have mixed feelings about those movies. But still, we've got Shudder putting out some great stuff. There's a lot of... I loved Karen Kusama's The Invitation. I really enjoyed yeah. that film. Um, how do you feel about the state of horror now, today? I mean, I, th I think from a business point of view the state is always the state it's been in it always will make money yeah and if you make a good one people will see it and if you make some bad ones people will see them too um you know they obviously did a lot of research at new line and they're like they decided it was cyclical but i think what makes it cyclical is you'd have a something original and something new come out like nightmare on elm street and then people would go and see it would become a huge hit and then people would start copying that. So yeah. you'd have you'd have a couple of years of like copycat movies and then people would start to burn out and then somebody would come up with something fresh again. So I think that's where the cycle lies. Totally agree. Um, I do feel like I feel like we're we we've definitely been in the supernatural horror space for a long time now. Um, I'm hoping slashers make a comeback. Um, you know, I thought Fear Street was fun. Um, and I mean, yeah, I think I think you know it'd be nice to see some slasher stuff come back. Why do you? Why is why that? Do you, I, I'm curious. Yeah, why, right, why I, I want to see it come back. Yeah. Well, I would ask you this: yeah. Why do you think supernatural? Obviously, to me, paranormal activity opened the door, and and a lot of J horror stuff when it was brought over, whether it was The Ring or The Grudge, this idea of ghosts and all that. And then we, I thought paranormal activity was genius in the sense that it preyed on the idea of of everybody falls asleep in their own bedrooms and there's monsters under the bed while they're in their, your closet too i thought that was great but why do you think that the the supernatural because i i don't know but it, it's baffled me that it's been here for so long what what is it with the I mean, ghosts i think personally because i think people are fascinated about life and if, if there's life after life and is there a heaven is there a hell you know, I think the, I think the, those kind of eternal questions that we have as people, I think they're always that we're always going to be drawn to supernatural stories right. uh, because of those those things. I mean, slashers are a lot of fun, and I think you can separate yourself from them if they're like Freddy or Freddy's not. Yeah, he's a slasher, but Freddy, Michael, it, those people like they can scare you, but they're not real. But there are real killers out there, which is kind of creepy. Um, so I think maybe, maybe that's why we gravitate more towards supernatural as well, is because it's it, it we we're intrigued by it, we're scared by it, um, we don't have answers to it, and right. also it's a little bit removed from thinking about actually all the real life horror that's out there. You can kind of separate yourself out from that a little bit, mm. I think, with supernatural stuff. Yeah, I agree. I mean, even when with you know Jason, Michael, Freddy, they're all supernatural in a way. Yeah, um, it's funny. Uh, just quickly, I just want to interject. Uh, uh, one of uh, one of our one of our watchers, Rob, Homo erectus, which is an amazing. Oh. Name. Old of a Gorge, Doctor Leaky. Yes, he says I see Rob as an exorcist guy, Jeffrey as a Halloween guy and Dave as a Texas Chainsaw Massacre guy. Is he right, guys? Oh, I, I, you know me. I am very much an Exorcist guy. I mean, The Exorcist is my favorite horror film of all time. Um, I, I, I think he's spot on, for me at least. Right. I, 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 definitely, I mean, Nightmare is my top by, by, just by far the original, but Definitely loved Halloween as well. Just so well made, and I, I, I think I, I look. I think Homer Erectus has got us uh, nailed. I, yeah. I really do. Uh, yeah, because I've never had a more visceral, more visceral experience than Texas Chainsaw, and 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 I, I would, I would be so blessed to be able to bring 
an experience like that a cinematic experience that is relentless yeah. from the very beginning and just gets tighter and tighter and tighter till the end i don't know it's it's been done so few times in that sense any all three of those movies really the achievement of what those three movies do and achieve on their own separate level has been done so very few times the way well, those three movies do them. You know, yeah. I always talk about, well, this name was hung on me, the Viceroy of Verisimilitude. I think right. the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and, and to a certain extent the Exorcist, but the Exorcist is much more fantastical than Texas Chainsaw. I think Texas Chainsaw is a singular achievement in cinematic horror. I... I the reality, I don't even know. I don't even think Toby Hooper knew. But the reality no. and the horror of that film is so profound. And it works on... The, the reality of it is so disturbing that I, I, don't, I, don't, I wish I knew how to recreate it. But it is a singular experience that is, is one of the most seminal cinematic horror films made or ever will be made. But I think also, I think The Exorcist, it, it, even though it, it goes to supernatural, the way it is presented, the way it's depicted, and the same with Halloween, which has an avert supernatural aspect to it. Yeah. But the way they're presented, the way they're made, is so grounded. Yeah. That's the one thing that all three of those movies have in common. Yes, they I agree. They are all 100%. very grounded. You know, in a sense, and and Elm Street, in a way, is very grounded in 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 a sense of the depiction of the characters in the real world experiencing this. Yeah. So, yeah, um, good on you. You you picked uh, you picked really three really good ones, and you yeah, I think you yeah, I think you nailed it. Yeah. Um, by the way, uh, Jeffrey, I, I want to say one of my moderators on this channel, the Richard, sends in a super chat and says, "I gotta go." Aloha to my fellow Kentucky boy, Jeffrey. Great seeing you again. We'll watch this with my mother later. Have fun all. Ah, ah thank you so much, brother. And uh, Honky yeah. Lips Throg says, I just got back from Bogota. <laughs> There's still good cocaine there. <laughs> Thanks, Honky Lips. Thanks, Honky Lips. Wow, what a name. Where did people... Uh, people well, Throg, Throg, Throg is a long time. Throg's one of the foundational members of the post-geek singularity. And I have, to, I have to shout out, Throg is a man that when there was no toilet paper on the shelves in L.A., somehow he's like, oh, I, I've got you. And he would send me giant boxes of toilet paper. That's and you because know Rob takes his Metamucil every day. Come on now. I mean, <laughs> Throg, awesome. Throg knows That's his awesome. stuff. By the I way, just like I just like I just like you know when you say throg, I just think of trog. trog I know, I me too. Trog, I knew. Trog. Now, hang on, uh, another viewer. Clint, this is <laughs> you guys. This is a good question. This is a good question. I, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. Clint Baker sends in a super chat and says, "Could it be that technology is ruining films? We were thrilled in the '80s by the VFX, but now we become spoiled." It's like auto tune. Is anyone really that impressed by a singer nowadays? What do you think? I'll hmm. let her guest answer first. Oh yeah, no, it's funny because I, I never want to be one of those, those people who's like, oh, these kids today. Um, what do you I mean, think, those people? Those kids, you know, like when <laughs> that's you get my older, tropic like, thunder. Like, you know, like, oh, you know, our, when our parents were like, oh, you kids, you know, but I think t technology has ruined a lot of things. Um, I think when the Internet came along, I was like, oh, great. People are going to be able to connect with each other from all around the world and see that we're all the same and except for some cultural differences and there will be unity and blah, blah, blah. And Twitter to fuck that one up. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think um, I think technology as far as CGI stuff goes has allowed filmmakers to ch make things look flashy but they can still look really cheap yep uh so if something's too heavily cgi'd i think 
it takes me out of it, but that's also because I'm spoiled by the makeup effects that I grew up with. And of course I can look back at them now and see the seams, but to me that's a part of like movie history and it's a part of my youth. Yep. So, you know, yes, I like practical effects over over digital effects any time. Yep. But I, I do recognize that with filmmaking now, things have moved to like digital platforms. People can shoot stuff on their cameras and shoot stuff for a lot cheaper, which I think is great for creative people. It's much easier now to make content than it was when I was growing up and the, with the equipment that we had. So I think there's a, a great plus side of the technology and that it's opened up avenues for people anywhere to make art and make films and do whatever they want. Um, but yeah, it's hard to get as excited as it used to be because you know, you have to na- navigate spoilers online and things get leaked before yeah. movies come out. And, you know, there's always, there's a lot of stuff that, you know, the, the, I think the spoilers annoys me. One of the, that's probably my biggest thing that annoys me is like people will watch a movie on Thursday night and literally start posting spoilers. And it's, and then they're like, well, just stay off the internet. It's like, well, because of like one douchebag, I have to stay off the internet. Yeah. <laughs> pretty much. Um, yeah, pretty much. I don't know. I think, yeah, but again, you know, I'm an older person. It, 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 it's a, it's You're a, an older person. I'm, I'm an old person. Now. I'm an old person. Now. Now. I can say this. Um, you know me. I don't like it here anymore. I don't understand. I'm going to go away now. Remember, remember and, our uh, game we played in New Zealand? Yes. Yes. The Brooks Hadland game. Brooks Hadland game. Everyone has to talk <laughs> like Brooks Hadland. <laughs> For the entire day. So, Anything you said. It worked, um, by the way. That was a good game we played. <laughs> I don't know, Rob. I uh, I like those practical effects. Things didn't move so fast. <laughs> The yeah, world no, just it, got up and got no, itself got in a itself great a hurry, big, big hurry. hurry. I'm I gonna leave here now. I didn't <laughs> I like, like the it. transformation in species. <laughs> there was no physicality to it. No, but the thing is, uh, there's there's something about knowing that people actually like had to build something in, in, a, in a in a physical 3d form instead of just on a computer but the thing is um i think uh we would we certainly wouldn't have gotten some of the mo- amazing movies that we we all know and love right now uh without cg we wouldn't have we wouldn't have any of the marvel movies without yeah, it but uh, but again i think there's a play i think that i think there's a place for both there's a, to me um it's a goddamn crime that rick baker is retired right now and he doesn't need to be i think that's that's a goddamn fucking shame well i i, I and jeffrey and maybe that. and and there's and there's and there there's a room for and i think the best is the blending of both well yeah look I'm with you, Dave. I think one of the great examples of that, I still think, I go back to 1997, and I think about Starship Troopers, which is one of the great examples of how practical CG model effects can be combined to... How about Lord of the Rings? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that that too. The model, with with the makeup effects and, and the models and the oversized sets and everything else, it's a perfect blend of this stuff. But there's, you know, there's still... Um, I, you know, Jeffrey, I would ask you this. I, I recently went back and watched, I have a 4k version of American werewolf. And to me, obviously Rick Baker won in 81, the first special effects makeup. Oscar. Ma- yeah. And that wasn't you know, a special award. Yeah. No, it was, they added that. They added that. No, that was the, the, that was the first category. First time, first time for, for and, category. and, yeah. I mean, I would ask you this. One of the great things about those effects is, I mean, it was obviously in camera. There yeah. wasn't CG. And when you're watching the way they the way they could combine physical effects with, you know, David McNaughton's face is here. He's screaming, watching his fingers elongate. You know, yeah. that all that in-camera stuff, it was so convincing. And it still is. You know, f- literally... It's now it's forty years later, and and well, I think oh, but I'll ahead, give you sorry. I'll give you what I'll give you another one. Someone else brought it up and reminded me. Thank you, Paul in Long Beach, Jurassic Park. 
Well, that's a that you know what that's a great example of combining CG and practical effects. Yeah. Yeah. But even that's but, 28 years old now. Yeah. Right. Uh, but Marvel still does it. I mean, it's amazing when you actually look at, like, when you watch some of the behind the scenes stuff, the amount of sets and practical stuff and makeup stuff that even, like, James Gunn and and um, uh, uh, James Wan on Aquaman uses to combine with the CG. And I think that's that helps. Again, it's not... It's not the same experience as American Werewolf, but again, American Werewolf wasn't creating an entire world. No, but I think that, that again, it comes down to filmmakers understanding how to use the tools properly. Yes. And, and I think... And I would, well, go ahead. Sorry. And I would say, you know, you know, mentioning American Werewolf in London, it's easier for an actor to be looking at something growing, you know, and react off that than it is like, follow, follow the green ball around the space. Yeah. We're gonna put right, it because on. we we've all seen how per, a perfect example. John Carpenter's the thing versus the 2011 thing, yeah. which is a prequel. Which the sad part about that one is, is that ADI effects did all practical stuff that then they the the producers decided to CG over. Oh, yeah, and hey, you uh, can watch it, and you can watch that raw uh, material on YouTube, and it's beautiful it's it's terrible. just you know yeah, it's just like that. oh my yeah. god or Cronenberg's the fly you know all i mean there's so many the howling all there i mean that's the thing it's an art and you can not or you shouldn't just have it go away because oh it's less time consuming to put some dots on someone's face yeah well, I mean, there's I, a I difference look. in there's difference in performance between you know the only time I will say where the argument might be valid is this: Tim Burton's Planet of the Apes versus the new trilogy of Planet of the Apes. Uh, I and it's very hard because the makeups in Tim Burton's Planet of the Apes are incredible, but everything in that new trilogy of Planet of the Apes is even better it is, it is incredibly stunning it, it, but, is, but, it, but is it but it, but is it is it the look of the apes or is it the storytelling that's better that makes it makes that stuff feel better i think it's a combination of both i, I mean look what we need uh what makes great films is i i, I am a firm believer in the auteurist theory you know it was west craven it, it it was Sean Cunningham, Friday the Thirteenth. I mean, it was. You need someone with a vision that knows what they want, and I think a lot of the time now with these gigantic two hundred million dollar studio pictures, we don't have, we're not getting visions anymore. And one of the things we all fell in love with was filmmakers who provided an experience. On there, like I, I, I was a John Carpenter fan because John Carpenter always shot in Panavision, you know, and 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 even he said, well, you know, after film school, I made Assault on Precinct Thirteen, and it's very clunky the way it was shot because I was just experimenting. But one of the great things, especially when he worked with Dean Cundey, was his movies had a look, a feel, to them, and and you felt the, and the authorship and the behind is the movie. And that's why we love those yeah. films. And, and the difference is, I, I was talking to someone where it was like, okay, when Spielberg, who was using Dean Cundey for a while, who Dean Cundey shot Jurassic Park, but then afterwards with Schindler's List, he went to Janusz Kaminski. And here was the reason why. Spielberg moves so fast, he wanted a fast DP. And Dean Cundey is painterly. He takes right. his time with yep. light. And that's what ultimately got him shafted out of things it was time because spielberg wanted to move 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 so he wanted a dp who was faster with lighting um fair enough you know it's and, and that's now fine. Dean Cundy, uh, and, and it's uh, uh, of course it's totally a preference um but it's sad because dean cundy like i think dean cundy was like sort of sidelined before his time Oh, before he actually, I, 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 before, before, 
his widescreen you know, photography is impeccable. I mean, the yeah, way he uses but, but again, but it, anamorphic but it lenses takes time, in the frame. But it, but, but, but it takes time. And now Hollywood is so god, you know, mm. the producers and everything are so goddamn impatient. It's like they don't want to wait an hour for someone to light a scene. Well, I would ask, Jeffrey, I would ask you. I mean, you directed a film that came out last year, 2020. Yes. What Sorry, was, Jeff. What was it Doctors. like? What was it like to, you know, once again, uh, what was it like to make a film? I, I assume, I don't know when you started shooting your film, but what was it like to direct horror now? What was that experience like? Well, um, it was it was a great learning experience because it's it's funny. I'd been on so many sets for my, my projects that I, you know, thought I knew what we were, you know, everything that needed to be done. And I, I knew a lot. Uh, but you don't know until you're actually on set and in dealing with with the crew. Yeah. Um, couple of the challenges, I, and this is going to come back to bite me. But when I wrote this movie, because it's about some people who witness somebody getting assaulted in a park and don't help, um, and they're outed to the public, and then something or somebody is killing them off, and so you don't know if it's supernatural or if it's a real killer. So it was a story that I wrote because originally I had a straight up splasher virgin virgin version and Virgins straight up are everywhere <laughs> okay. and a straight up supernatural version and so the producer i was working with was like why don't you make it more of a mystery where you don't know hmm. so i ended up because i made that choice where you can't you don't see anybody dying on screen like it's just the aftermath uh because you can't give away what's coming after them so i knew as a horror fan going in that that would be problematic because hmm. people, especially when they, you know, hear Final Destination or any of my other films, um, there are expe there are certain expectations that are coming from this. And plus, we did it on on a very very low budget. No, right. I'm very happy. At the end of the day, I'm very happy um, because I know what we had to work with and what we were able to accomplish. So I'm actually ha very happy with the film. Um, it would have been a different film had we had a much bigger budget. Sure. Uh, but like you said about watching your film, like, you know, my friends who were directors told me, like, you're either going to finish this and you're going to hate it and not want to work again in the business or you're going to love it and want to do it again or somewhere in that spectrum. But you'll either know. So I definitely have some other horror films that I want to do because I have the way that I want to tell them. I just want to make sure I get the budget to kind of do everything that I want to do. With right. It. Well, I mean... Are you optimistic? Like the horror genre has been one of the most endearing, enduring, and uh, uh, genres in in Hollywood. It's never gone out of style. They've always made horror films. How do you feel about the state of cinematic horror now? I mean, I I'm still I'm always optimistic about it. Um, I mm -hmm. again I think the plus side of all the technology we have is is there are so many ways for fresh voices to break through for new stories to come in that are exciting. Um, and it's, it's also fun to revisit the classics. Like, you know, you can right. see a, you know, watch a good slasher movie now. And it's just, a, you know, it just takes me back to when I was younger. Um, so, you know, there's always going to be, you know, when it, when it's easier to make something, you're going to have a flood of material out there that you're going to have to sift through. So, you know, finding like the gems means often, sifting through a lot of not gems right. um but that's the same well for put. anything you know like if you look at my scripts like there's some really good scripts in there but there's there's some clunkers you know like i'm not one of these writers that thinks that i'm i'm brilliant and everything i write is brilliant i'm, I'm quite the opposite but um you know that's that happens on either side like if you're looking for things to watch again especially in horror you've we've always had to shift sift through a lot of crap from people who are just in it to make money and so they thought they knew what worked for yeah her. oh man I know. Uh, you know it's like well let's just throw some titties and some blood at the screen and then people will that's watch what it. i do titties and blood <laughs> yep yeah um that's why yeah that's, I, that's why i do. watched sleepaway camp because i heard there was a penis in it even though it was a very traumatizing shot um, <laughs> well you you well got, i you, i hope you, that's you, not you, why you <laughs> watched i spin on your grave <laughs> You got, you oh, got yeah. what you, of yeah, course. Yeah, I know that too. Yeah, that was a traumatizing penis shot. 
<laughs> penises. They don't get enough. Re- they don't get enough exposure in horror films. All right, dude, I'm with you, man. I I want to see some unfurling happening. It's oh not enough. Goodness. That's a that's a very uh, the, that's a new a very uh, fancy da- word. Da- David Cronenberg's The Unfurling. Dude, the unfurling. come on! I want I want to see it. You just need to make The Unfurling. It's just such a disturbing uh, word. Yeah. The well, speaking Robert of Burnett, disturbing, Robert Burnett brings you The Unfurling. Hey, man! You know, I'm not beyond enjoying in a. Oh, never mind. Yes. Uh, the uh, R- mm, sends in a diamond super chat. Our, our uh, Clint, okay, Clint Baker. This, this is interesting. There's a couple of things here. Clint Baker says the Michelangelo of mind control. I don't know if you're hanging that on me, but Clint goes on and says, by continuation, people aren't as excited about the 23rd Marvel movie because they're not impressed because of the technology. Well, I mean, Jeffrey, you you said I can see behind you. You have Marvel uh, hardcovers behind you. You're a Marvel fan. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm a Marvel. Yeah, I, I, I'm a as am fan. I. Grew up watching them. I, I I mean, I don't think people look. I don't think that anybody should just take what they shovel at you and accept it. But God damn, the Marvel Cinematic Universe represents some pretty high bar work, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I would. I mean, and again, it's it, everything. Certainly, is personal. Taste. I mean, there, there, there is a formula. I think to Marvel movies. Sure. Um, but that they still put a lot of care and thought into. I mean, the, the whole universe that they've created is, if you think of, even if, even even if all the things don't click together, the fact that they've been able to create such a vast universe and then spinoffs and TV and um, it's pretty takes some pretty amazing planning and and you know. A good I think story so too. Is, as a good story is a good story like i'm i'm excited to see shang chi tomorrow but um i think you're gonna love it you know a, a good story w- you know wins out i think over the special effects for sure so if it's just the special effects kind of orgy well that might be actually kind of fun um <laughs> no i mean yeah, it, so. yeah. i i know i think you're gonna like shang chi it's it's it it earns it earns its status yeah. Uh, this is a good question. Our friends Twin Flicks hmm. uh, says, which, this is actually a really good question, which type of horror film is more difficult to make, Supernatural, Demons, Ghosts, or a slasher movie? I, I, you know, I think it depends on when you say what's the most difficult to make. Like, if you're talking about from a writing perspective... Um, I find supernatural horror easier to write. I mean, I wrote my first slasher movie, but then you're kind of going through your catalog of like, how can I kill somebody in a way that I haven't seen in a hundred (laughs) times? Um, Whereas I think you have more uh, to play with in the supernatural world. Uh, That's just from a writing perspective. I, I, you know, from directing, I would, I would talk to Dave who's, who's got more experience. Like mine was a mixture of, of both, What uh-huh. do you think, Dave Parker? Yeah, Dave. I mean, come on, you 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 gotta weigh in, Mister Parker. Wait, I thought you'd have. What do like... I think? No, what do I think is more difficult? Uh, read the question again, Rob. Okay, Just refresh <clears throat> me. Uh, uh, Twin Flick says, which type of horror film is more difficult to make? Supernatural, demons, ghosts, or slasher movies? Slasher. The realistic ones are, are are definitely, especially now, I think, definitely harder to make to to really scare an audience why With why do you why do you think that is i think because the supernatural gives you a leeway of doing some really out of the box fantastical stuff instead of having to stay totally grounded where you right. can go, you know you know scare the audience where i think if you are doing a slasher that is more grounded or not supernatural um, in the sense of, but even 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 if you just just Jason, who oh he, he just never dies, he can't be killed every time you like knock him down, he gets up again. Uh, but I think it's it's more difficult to keep that consistently going and scary. Where is a supernatural thing? You can bring in a lot more uh, things 
to throw at the audience and, and give the audience. Um, so I think I think I think being really realistic and getting under people's skin in that way is, is much more difficult than than being a supernatural fantastic. Yeah, there's only so many things you can stab people with um, in right. a slasher movie. So. Right. I mean, you know, and maintain scares, which is why, you know, when you get something like Silence of the Lambs, it really is truly terrifying. It's truly well, frightening by the by the end of that movie. It's absolutely harrowing. I, I think, you know, the for me, horror has never been about death so much as it's been about having to live another day in this reality where everything is insecure and you have no idea whether you're going to live or die by the end of a day. You know, that's, that's, what, that's what I find so great about horror. But the thing about slasher films is that, okay, fear of death is great, but what slasher, it's like what that woman says in Videodrome when, when that, that uh, European woman yes. says to Max Wren, Max, Videodrome is dangerous because it has a has philosophy. A philosophy. Yep. And I, I, that, I love that. I always love that. And I was like, yeah. The, the problem with so many slashers is like Michael Myers was made that way. Like he didn't want to kill he just, you know, I, no, 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 no. I see that. He's that's a weird. supernatural your, entity. He didn't give up that, his. That, I was gonna say that's your interpretation. To me, it's like, yeah, he, he's, he's not human from the beginning, and I think that's what Carpenter was always saying. He's like, yeah, I agree. Like, like something was embodying this child that made yeah, him yeah. his sister, but it's not human. Yeah. No, I, I, but I'm, I, not, but I, I'm not. But I'm not going to answer what it is. Yeah, no, so I, I'm, I agree. I'm, I agree with you 100. percent I mean, you know. Halloween was the first pre-recorded video because that I, my first piece of physical media. I probably watched that film two hundred times, you know. And I had every kid over and watched it. If you mm -hmm. watch it now, it's almost like a children, like Phantasm. It's <sighs> it's so it's bloodless and it's quaint and it's effective and it's beautiful. And so is Phantasm, by the way. But again, there, with Phantasm, there's there's that uh, eerie underlying. Uh, but again, a, a perfect example of uh, of a movie, a movie and a movie series that I absolutely love is Phantasm, and I always think that Phantasm never gets its due. No, it, it yeah. never does. Um, wait, wait, Jeffrey, I, I what do you, what do you, how do you feel about? Sorry, I mean. Yeah. Phantasm to me was the precursor to the Nightmare franchise. Do you are you a Phantasm fan? Yeah, yeah. I remember before it came out, and they were showing the pictures in Fangoria of the spear with the blood spewing out, and I was like, I got to see this movie. And then I watched it. I was like, I don't know what the hell I just watched, but I liked it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I love the first Phantasm. I love it. I, 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 it's, it's such a to me. It's such a special movie and yeah. and uh, again it but it, it's like but what is that movie really saying what what is, what are the fears that is addressing is it just addressing the fear of death or is it addressing the fear of abandonment mike is clearly your family afraid yeah. that his family you know his brother is going to abandon him his parents have already died and his brother gone. wants to abandon him that's a thing it, it, it's yeah, like he wants to he's a young man he wants to live his life and he's saddled by this kid um there's a lot that's the thing there's a lot of layers to that movie whether they're there intentionally or not um which is what i always find it fascinating i always get a little more out of that movie each time there's a lot of things to unpack in that movie where they may have just been going well this will be freaky it's like you know right from the beginning you know you got the lady in lavender you know, doing this guy and everything, and then she turns into the tall man. So what? <laughs> what? What? What are they saying there? It's like so the tall man is this person from another dimension that is. Uh, he's uh, he's non-binary. He's non-binary. He's, non he, he's the tall man. He, is non-binary. He, he's the first transsexual fucking horror villain. I wouldn't call him transsexual. I think he's just non-binary. Well, he turns into he turns into the lady lavender. Yeah, he goes he, from male to female. Wants to. You know, I, I want I, I, yeah. I, I, at a whim. So they were like going to cover everything. They were like, we're going to get the sex in there and the death. 
Yeah, and I right. think they were just doing it because it's like, oh, this would be freaky and confusing and dreamlike and everything, and and that's what I appreciate about the movie. But yeah, it's it's very interesting. But um, yeah, I, I just think that you know, I'll give it to you know again, but doing doing a, a, a grounded, realistic, you know, horror movie, and still being entertaining and everything. Uh, I'm trying to think the last time, as far as like a slasher that they did that, like gangbusters, it would probably be the first scream. And that was a long yeah. time ago now. Well, I, I would say like, again, I brought up earlier, but I love Karen Kusama's the invitation. I, I not I, a it's slasher a, movie. It's just a, it's just, no, a, but, but in terms of a horror a film, that's totally set in the yeah, real world. And it just, yeah, you're watching great. it. I was like, Oh my God. I mean, it's a perfect, it, it it's aged again, like you've said, like fine wine, like QAnon and all that. Like, wow. But the difference with the invitation is as great a movie it is uh, as it is. It's not really fun. It's not one you're going to watch on repeat a lot. And it's no to... martyrs, Dave. <laughs> right. And uh, well, that that one's just pure masturbation material, Rob. I don't know what you're talking about. I know, man. I mean, I, I you know, <laughs> it, it gets me. Martyrs gets me so hot. Martyrs Dude. gets Rob hard. Dude, no, it, uh, like that that yeah, film. Yeah, I have yeah. to say, I have to say. Um, <laughs> so, for those of you who don't know, you have to watch the French version. The American version is abysmal. But so, but you I mean the remake? Say, no, the original. The, version, yeah, the, the original, original version. version. What, yeah. what I have to say about Martyrs, though was, you know, Martyrs was being covered in Fangoria. And even if you read the Fangoria article, it left you like, what the hell is this movie about? Like, I never, I'm like, what is this? I, I did, And finally I got it. I think part of as Miramax Extreme, I got Inside and Martyrs, which I think, by the way, is the two, those two films, one of the greatest double features ever. You watch mm. Martyrs well, well, and well, you want to... Well, well. I think Inside is like a Looney Tunes cartoon. Oh, come on. It's Inside's a, a little crazy. It's, I mean, it it's is. crazy, it, but, it, but it, it's so unbelievable, and there's some really stupid stuff in it, unlike Martyrs. The cop stuff is really okay, stupid wait, in Inside. D d you, 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 you can make fun of my double feature all you want, sir. No, you can but I would... No, I'm not making fun of your double feature. I'm just pointing out that one is superior. Yes, it is. That's why you start with martyrs, and uh, when you're so depressed, you you end with inside because it's just fun. You know, I wanted to make <laughs> and my then you dream. watch it down with a little bit of irreversible. Oh, dude, I can't. Come on, why why are you gonna do it to me? <laughs> I mean, Jeffrey, I will tell you, my dream project was to remake Inside with Angelina Jolie and Jennifer Aniston. Oh my. God. God, oh, that'd that be would, awesome. Oh, uh, right? The it would be story. fucking awesome. The backstory between those two and Brad Pitt right in the middle would be amazing. I, That's great. I that know. is great. That is. That it, but is then great. they remade Inside in America. It's terrible. It's so bad. I didn't see it. No, I didn't see it either. Don't ever. Neither one of you. Don't oh, that, there's, the one, there's the one Jeff didn't see. <laughs> uh, don't see that. Of all the crappy movies I've seen, there's one I haven't seen. Is it called Inside or did they rename it? No, it's called no, Inside. It's called Inside. Yeah. I think it's on Hulu now, probably. Don't even. Just don't. Oh, I'm going I'm to do it. Rob. Hulu. Oh, Jeff, yeah. um, I, I can't. I'm going to do it. Yeah, sorry. I know it's there. I can't not watch it now. Uh, guys, talk amongst yourselves for a minute. I have to. Uh, Shit, I was just about to do that. I was just I've about been holding to... mine in for whatever. But we're um... all going away. Just stand by, guys. No, just no. watch a watch a blank screen. No, Jeff is going to juggle for you while Rob and I go <laughs> use the restroom. Bye. I can't do that. Who, whoever oh, moves oh. first gets to go. Okay, you I go. See, well, I can't oh see my. any of the chat stuff, so I can't answer any questions. Oh well, I'll give you some. There, the people are firing in uh, questions. Um, <clears throat> Twin Flicks uh, again says. To go with what Dave said about Dean Cundy, in our interview with him, he admitted that he stopped doing studio films because it's all about quick paced work and no one takes their time anymore to set up a great shot because it's all yeah. virtual cinema. Now, I was on a studio lot a couple days ago looking at the volumes or the stagecraft, the stuff Lucasfilm is using to shoot The Mandalorian. Which is fine, but it doesn't look real. 
you know? So I would ask yeah. you, I mean, wh- how do you feel as a director when you're setting up shots and composing things? What do you think about that? No, I mean, you. the thing is you want to have time, but that's also when you're shooting a movie, that's your that's your biggest enemy is time and money because the less yeah. money you have, the less time you have. So um, you don't have the luxury unless you're a really big budget film of, of kind of taking your your time to do things uh, the old fashioned way. And I, and I will say that there is definitely an artistry to the creature designs that are done and the, the visual, you know, artists oh, yeah. I think are, are in their own, in their own way. And especially if it's used correctly, I shouldn't even say in their own way they are. Um, it's just a matter of whether people are using their art correctly or just kind of, this is a lot cheaper and faster. Um, mm. Let's do this the whole movie. Um, um, yeah. Now that you've, you're a director, uh, tell us about how you prep for stuff. Like if you're shooting a, a death scene or a, an effect scene, like how, how much work do you put in beforehand? Do you, do you allow the previous company or whatever to do it for you? Are you working with a storyboard artist? How do you, uh, uh, how do you do that? What is your process? You know what? I've done storyboard artists and I've done, um, uh, shot list. Sorry, I was like, what is that other thing I did? Um, more caffeine, Jeff. Um, more? More? No, no. Well, I'm, I just more. got it. In there. Um, I want. More. I think in visual terms, so I like storyboarding. Um, but the funny thing is, like, I, ha- I had my friend, um, you know him too, Paul Salamoff. Oh, um, of course. Salamoff. Salamoff. What did I say? Salamoff. Because he's you. drinking. Come on, we're all having fun. <laughs> It's tea. Jeff is drinking tea. I'm drinking Jeff tea. is the sober one here, Rob. We're all kind of sober. But I had him. I had him storyboard the whole film based More than on usual. us doing it with the studio. Right. So basically, when we decided to kind of do it independently, like the storyboards just kind of went out the window at that point. Huh. Um, so I, you know, I I think everybody's got a kind of a different thing, but for me, especially with this next film I'm doing, which is a slasher film, you know, I've just made it very clear to everybody, like we have to protect the days that we're shooting our, our death scenes and our set pieces. Like, you know, not that anything else isn't important, but a lot of times when people are scheduling genre films that they don't understand it, they're just breaking it down by location and cast. And you're like, well, we can't shoot like this huge five page, like chase and stunts and everything like that. We can't shoot this in one night. No, that, um, and that's your right. raison d'être, you know, is, is killing people. Yeah. That's, a yeah. slasher lives and dies by, by its kills. Yeah, yeah, and they always want to shortchange that part of it. Rob, do you need a break? Or Jeff, who needs a break more? I mean, I've never seen uh, Jeff go this long without having to use the bathroom, so I'm not sure. <laughs> Maybe you have to rock, Rob, paper, scissor it, guys. You can go can first, I go first? Rob. Okay, I, I'm going to put you guys uh, yeah. on. Okay, you guys, I'm giving it to you. You're on uh, yep. together. I'll All right, be yeah, back. You know, I can't have a, I can't be having a weak bladder, you know, on YouTube. So I'm just gonna hold, I'm just gonna pee in a cup off screen, and you won't even know, and I'll just be like, yeah, I didn't. That's go. why Jeffrey Reddick wears Depends. Hey, the official sponsor of Midnight Metal. Rob's wearing them now, but he's filled it up and has to change <laughs> them right now. That's why he's leaving. <laughs> this is what happens when Rob leaves. We're free to say whatever we want. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Parker. All right, let's get into the shit, yeah. man. Come on, let's man. Let's get into the shit. Let's talk about music. What music what? thing oh. happened? What what music thing happened this week that you're excited about? What well, um there was an epic event that is metal in its own way, but not metal. Oh man. I don't know. Really? Why don't you yeah, tell some, the people? Why don't you tell them? Somebody dropped an album. No, Ooh. someone, someone, someone dropped a huge hammer this week. Ah, uh, I'm not getting your clue. Uh, the hammer wasn't a, a clue, actually. Uh, Iron Maiden came out with a new album, but uh, oh, cool. But you know what? You know what, guys? And you can say this is not metal, and you know what? Technically, it's not metal, but it's kind of metal that they're doing this. Abba's come back. Oh, really? They said they would never do that. They've recorded a new album. They're building a studio, a stage, a stadium 
in London for this top of the line ahead of its game holographic concert that sounds where where they where where they where they've all gotten scanned cgi scanned to to appear as their younger versions of themselves to do this concert in this state-of-the-art new holographic stadium so it won't it'll be looking like young them yes it'll look like young them well that's kind of I guess if I act now, I want to do that because I still want to play a high schooler getting killed by Freddy. So I guess maybe else. Why I can't you play? Uh, look, you know, you could. You know, Yafet Koda was not a young high school student, and he was in a Freddy movie. Why couldn't you be? Well, yeah, that's true. What you're just so vain that you have to be a high school student? No, now, no, Jeff? I could. Let's I talk could about do... the psychological aspects of this. No, I could do college. Yeah. I think college. Oh, oh, college! You couldn't be a professor, but you. Could I be... could be a professor, but I have to grow a mustache, and it looks weird on me. A mustache? Why? Why don't? Don't you have a photo of you with mustache that you could show everyone? I, I think they'd all love to, to see it. I, I don't. I can't pull <laughs> up photos on my laptop randomly, no. um, because I don't know what'll. I don't even know how to search for it. All right. Uh, but let's go into music for a minute here. Yes. What do you what, what do you listen to? What are you into? What what, what kind of what kind of metal does Jeffrey Reddick get down with? You know what? I get down with a lot of stuff because I, I grew up, uh, you know, my again, my mom collected a lot of music. So we had everything from like blues to country to rock to pop in our house. Um, so I have very eclectic tastes. Right. Um, my playlist has a mixture of horror soundtracks, pretty much every genre of music, and I just hit shuffle. Who is your favorite composer for horror films? Oh, that's tough. I mean, I really like John Carpenter's work. I really, I just think consistently because I grew up on it, and he he did such great scores for like escape to new york and you know so many films like i i would have to say him just because of the films and the quality of films that he did like okay now when uh when you're writing when you're writing a new script especially if you're writing a new horror movie now you write all different kinds of genres you're you're constantly working in all kinds of different genres but when you write when you write a horror thing are you do you listen do you listen to music? Do you listen to scores? And if you do, who are you? Who you, who do you listen to when you when you are writing? I did the old um, the old. Um, I listen to music and scenes. So I have a playlist that I put together from on YouTube that's got like themes from everything from like Psycho to you know The Shining, um, Demons, Suspiria, of course. Nightmare on Elm Street, but then I'll also have like scenes from the movie, like the Drew Barrymore scene or the Tina death scene from Nightmare on Elm Street. Like I have seen, or V, one of my favorite sci-fi shows of all time. Okay. Um, the so, original so V? Oh, yeah. yeah. Like yeah. The, 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 because there, you know, V has great, uh, even V, the final battle with Barry DeVorzon, who did the score for the Warriors. Oh uh, yeah. Well, oh, well you know, Jeffrey's worked with Jeffrey's worked with Jane Badler. I know. Yeah. Jane Badler is in my short and I Dirty Diana. Her. She was like the best <laughs> the best villainess ever. And um, she ate that fucking uh what was it a uh, guinea pig? Hamster. Yeah. Guinea pig. Hamster, hamster, guinea pig. What, guinea pig. I was like I was like that was some eye opening shit on television, I'll tell you, at my age. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it is funny to watch today cuz it's Definitely TV special effects. Yeah. But when you were a kid, you were like, holy crap. Pretty um, good. Um, by the way, I, you know, there, there's a, a lot of really interesting questions. Uh, Mike Alito, who is a, a longtime member of the channel, I've had some great conversations with him. He's a terrific guy. He also went and saw Tango Shalom yesterday at the Empire 25 in New York. He, Yay, he, you, uh, got a mu- you got a muzzle I top. Meant, I meant to start that off, Rob. I meant to congratulate you when I first came on. But I was having trouble with the camera, so I forgot to be. Like, yeah. Oh no! It's, congratulations. It, uh, thank you. That's it's amazing. crazy to, to. I mean, you know, it's it's it, as everyone knows, it's really hard to get a movie theatrically released, and 
and not only that, but it's 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 going wider, and it's people seem to like it. It's a crazy fakakta movie, but uh, it was great to thank you. I appreciate that. So it's good to have yeah, it no, out there. Yeah, I'll check it out. So I'm, I'm yeah, go, it's a, it's in Encino, or or go see it at the West Side Pavilion. It'll be there all week. But Mike Alito says he says today's generation doesn't need validation. They need to be spanked. It's our fault. Because we did a poor job of raising them. You reap what you sow. Do you agree with that? What do you guys think? See, I, I mean, I, again. I, go ahead. So, I, so we're talking about parental discipline right now. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm not a parent, but no. But I, I do think that um, kids have a lot more. I think they're a lot more. I think because of the, you know, again, I, I think the internet has a lot to do with this. There's a lot of yeah. parents let the internet raise their kids now. And so on one level, they're maturing faster than they used to. But on the other hand, I don't think we're preparing them for how tough the world is when they get out into it. Because I think right. on, on some levels, we, you know, kids are growing up so sensitive. But a lot of that's because of online bullying. There's all kinds of other reasons that we didn't have to deal with on such a level like yes we had to deal with bullying in schools but you know that's different than when you have like hundreds and hundreds of people piling on you online so um yeah i, I mean i definitely see some kids that need to be spanked hmm. um i'm like friggin swat that kid on the butt sorry i get, i grew up swatted on the butt sorry. me too i did yeah, too so, like i you yeah, know so was... I, I i'm just like you know my parents disciplined me and i i, I think i i've grown up to uh Maybe not, not interrupt people when they're talking, but uh, I, to to at least sort of uh, be respectful and, and have manners. Yeah. And I think that that may have been lost a little bit now. And the fact that kids can like sue their parents for like you know being disciplined and stuff to me. I mean, some of the stories you hear is kind of crazy. It's like you know, um, I think trauma is such a hot word now that people like to use and they like to magnify it and exaggerate their trauma to get more attention on themselves. I think the internet has, is, has made people a bunch of attention mongers instead of actually trying to be good people. Hang on. I've got to check my Instagram real quick and see if anybody's I'm trying. <laughs> um, uh, I want to say Lil Nate, Lil Nate, Lil Nate sends a generous tip from Canada and just says cheers from Canada. Let me tell you about Canada, America's hat. I love Canada. I'm a huge fan of Canada. One of my favorite cities in Canada is, wait for it, Canadians, Winnipeg. No, so, we, shot, uh, we shot Tamara in Winnipeg. Okay, I got to tell uh, you about Winnipeg. So uh, Winnipeg had Canada's first openly gay mayor, and it was in Nin uh, 1998 no it was 1999 it was the dead of winter in 99 free enterprise played at a film festival in winnipeg and uh uh paul collegeman who worked for a company called regent entertainment was there he just saw free enterprise and i met the mayor of winnipeg he says listen man i'm gonna have a party you, you, you guys should stick around Winnipeg and come to my party. And I'm like, okay, the first openly gay mayor of Winnipeg is having a party, and we've made a film that he asked us. I'm like, bruh, we're staying. We're staying for the party. It's going to rule. So what ended up happening was we ended up selling Free Enterprise because of the party that that mayor threw in Winnipeg in the dead of winter. It was so cold. The snow was so cold that it would blow. It was awesome. I want to make a horror film in the dead of winter in Winnipeg. It was amazing. And and we sold Free Enterprise because the mayor of Winnipeg threw a party. That's awesome. Uh, and I, I'm I, right there with you. I want to make a winter horror movie so bad. Now, it's going to suck to make. Yeah. Because you have to, it's like, I've never been colder in my life than when I went to uh, Prague in February for Narnia, where they decided like two miles away from the Polish 
the Poland border to shoot some snow scenes. I've never been colder in my life, but there is absolutely no question oh. that the the imagery, which was not CG enhanced, was absolutely stunning and incredible. Jeffrey, when did you shoot in Winnipeg? What time of year? Um, it was it was uh, winter spring. I was have to do that stupid song. <laughs> it was um fall because it 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 was getting cold if you watch a couple of scenes in tamra um you can see tell the actors noses are, are red yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i Man. felt horrible for jenna duan because she had to wear for the last part of the movie like this you know slim you know sleeveless dress and she was such a trooper but she you know she had to just be out there with that dress just that dress on and everybody else had jackets Oh man, I well, mean, well, well, who who wrote it that way? Jeffrey? Well, I didn't write it to be shot in the cold, right? Oh, it would be a hot, hot gotcha. sultry summer when I, when I wrote it. And she oh, was, it was sultry. It was sultry. There's a word that we don't use anymore. Um, uh, Echo. Actually, Mikey Leto did send in a super chat. Thank you, Mikey. Uh, Echo Base Network says we watched Iron Eagle with our subscribers tonight, and they loved it. <laughs> okay. Iron Eagle, directed by Sidney Fury. That was in his canon days when he was directing Superman with, 4. The man who directed The Taking of Pelham 1, 2, by, 3. With an amazing song by Queen. Yeah. In Iron Eagle. Uh, I don't know. Oh, man. Uh, Iron Eagle. S amazing. Stubble McShave, one of the longtime watchers of the channel, says, Speaking about rock and metal. Do you think the conversation about guitar gods have disappeared from music discourse? I remember when the names like Hendrix were spoken in reverence. That doesn't happen now. It's not part of the discussion. Are guitar gods dead, gentlemen? What do you think? No. I don't know, but this is probably the best time for me to go to the restroom and let Taylor. <laughs> All right, then. Uh, I don't have a problem with that, Jeffrey. You go. I'll you drain back. the main vein. I'll be back. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, Guitar gods? No, we. I mean, hang look, on, Dave. Still Let, let's. Uh, we're gonna come oh, back sorry. in here. So, pardon. Guitar pardon. gods. Slash. Zach well, Wild. I mean, our Kirk Hammett's still alive. Kirk, Kirk Hammett's still alive. Uh, Lenny Kravitz is still still going, dude. I just appreciate uh, anyone who uh, plays instruments yeah. these days. Fuck it, fucking Dave Grohl. I Dave mean, Grohl, dude. On. What like, a he's yeah. a great frontman too. He's a great showman. Uh, me and a great drummer. I mean, and a great filmmaker. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I think we're missing guitar gods. You know what? I think we're missing guitar gods. Here's the thing. Even I, who was never really a musician, I wanted to be a guitar god when I was a kid. You wanted to be a front man. You wanted to stand up and shred on stage because the chicks would love you. I wanted my guitar to, sm to, to burst and smoke and shoot rockets out of it. Like Dude. Ace Freely. I know. I, 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 look, rock and roll is inherently uh, not good. It's a genre that has fallen from favor, I think. Uh, By the way, I Jeffrey mean, is back. I, I, Welcome back, Jeffrey. Wow, man. You know what? Yeah. That was literally just changing the tube in the catheter. Dude, I, that, I had the biggest <laughs> scream of urine that I've ever seen. Yeah, dude, I had to walk inside. I'm in a second structure. I had to go inside my house. Come on. I'm always very quick, and I don't. Wa I didn't wash my hands because my, you know, my junk is clean. So I like that, Jeffrey. Just so you guys know, Jeffrey is always very quick. Oh, cool yes. now. And clean, apparently. Yeah, no, not quick. Clean. And Look, I mean, no, I, 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 I have Purell. Uh, I believed mm. in a freshly shorn scrot for a very long time, pre Austin Powers. Just saying. Midnight Metal, sponsored by Manscape. Dude, have you seen? I mean, all of a sudden, YouTube is full of man, that Manscaped company. 
Oh, I thought you were going to say it was full of like shaved balls, but that, it is well, it kind of is. No, it's um, all about yeah. shaved. I mean, but back in the hey, day, dude, man, I, 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 I've been a faithful subscriber to Manscaped for over a year now. Oh, you have? Oh yeah, I've, I've been a faithful manscaper for thirty years. Well, I've been manscaping, but official manscaping. How no, how are their uh, how I've are their been, products? Are they good? Their products are their products are great. Uh, they're they're ball toner and and the non chafing uh, lotion is is very good. That's fucking metal, dude. I think that's and smell, amazing. And it, it smell and it smells good too. Well, so that's, I've been t so I've been told. That's fantastic. <laughs> I mean, I I I just I want to make sure you know. That the entire area between the butt crack and the scrotum make sure they're freshly shorn all the time. Because you, what, guys? I was a now Boy Scout man. That... I was a Boy Scout. Always be prepared. So now you all know that Rob's taint is very smooth. It is and clean. Just saying. I don't know what that has that's to do with the show. Rob's like, I'm, I'm just putting that out there. My taint is clean. Just saying, My taint you know. is clean. Like, like, what, what's getting it dirty, Rob? Are you getting a little leakage going on, like, one way or the other? That Nothing would gets make the taint in between, The only like, thing that gets it dirty is the reason I cleaned it up in the first place, Dave. Come on, now. Ooh. Just saying. Just Jeffrey, saying. Jeffrey, what, what do you have to say about this? Well, I don't <laughs> see how. No, but just considering... Technically, what the taint is made of, I don't see how you'd get anything on your taint. Well, just sweat. Maybe. Yeah, working okay, out, yeah, just sweat. walking. Yeah, yeah. I've had some crop potch cooking going on today. It was very warm here in California. Oh, come so, on, man. Yeah. God, it was. You know, it was hot, <laughs> as, it was hot, it was hot <laughs> as balls. It was hot as. It was hotter than balls. It, it was, was hotter than balls. It was so. It was so hotter than balls that you shouldn't have really. You should just let your balls be out because you know you could like deplete your. You know, I, I was gonna say I lost hundreds of level. thousands of of my progeny today. Uh, 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 of the, they of all the died. Swimmers. Yeah, they're gone. <laughs> they're gone. They're gone. And then I went and walked the dogs tonight, and more died. So you know, I killed. It was Ooh. a ma It was a whole. It was a massacre. Uh. So guitar gods, we we talked about that. Um, Clint, 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 Clint Baker, Clint Baker does say something interesting. And since we're all fans, Marvel hasn't let me down yet. Even their okay movies are way better than everything else out there. It's human nature to push push back when being spoon fed entertainment. The MCU is being taken for granted. Do you think it's true? No, it's like the MCU is making so much gobs of fucking money. You can't say that it's being taken for granted. But I'm taken for granted. The movies I make are taken for granted. The Rob's, the Tango Shalom is taken for granted. Jeffrey Reddick's movies are taken for granted. Fucking Marvel, like in in in, in a weekend, makes more money than we'll ever see in our lives. So I I no. All right. I I, <laughs> I, I, argue, I would, you you two argue with me. I just defended I would, no, I us. Say, all. I would just say no, but I would say. What he says, taking for granted, if he's talking about the artistry of some of them, mm -hmm. for sure, where they're just considered. Agreed. Friends that are like, I'm not going to go see a stupid comic book movie. Yeah, I agree. With maybe, that. maybe, but maybe, but maybe that's not. Maybe that's just not their thing. I don't know. You know, the the, the I think that I think the wow. The, uh, can I just? Uh, I'm sorry. Mm. Brandon Valenzuela says, Drew Barrymore in Doppelganger on Ooh. VHS was my Ooh. jam back in the day. Doppelganger, directed by the director of Time Bomb. Was it Avi Time Nesher? Time Bomb? Remember Avi Ta Nesher? No, wait, wait, wait. Was it? Yeah, wait, Avi Nesher. Wait, did he, do time, did he do Time Bomb? Yeah, dude. With Michael I, Bean? Michael Bean, yes. Yes, I went and saw... I saw Doppelganger at the UA on the corner on Westwood Boulevard. You know, it was it yes, was it yes, was south yeah, yeah. it was south of Wilshire. I think I think I saw it at an Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror screening. Uh yeah, and Avi wow, Nesher was one of those guys. He's still making movies. Fuck yeah, of course. Yeah, Doppelganger was not good. It was yeah. not good. No, 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 it wasn't. Remember no. Poison Ivy with Drew Barrymore? Oh, oh yeah, well, that was good. <laughs> that was like pure spank material. What do you uh, that, was, that, that, that yeah. yeah, that was another New Line gem. Yep. Hey. It spawned two sequels, so it was a gem, Jeff. It was a gem. No, it, the first one was really good. 
Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I wouldn't say really good. It was super trashy fun. It was it no was, wild you know, things. Come on now. No, here's the thing. Um, Poison Ivy was that era's Angel. Ooh. Oh. The Angel Trilogy. The Angel Trilogy. Yeah. Which, if you ever really want a postcard time capsule time machine, watch Angel, and you'll see what Hollywood, and specifically Hollywood Boulevard, was like back in the early 80s. Yeah. You know... It's fascinating, because it's so different now. You know what someone needs to remake? Well, it's like, I've got a, I've got a hooker from... No, no. From Hollywood Boulevard. Uh, right I, I got to say that <laughs> oh, one you? of my favorite, one of my favorite uh, remasters, oh, yeah. this film, this film, if anything should be remade, Massacre at Central High should be remade. I don't think you could do it now. Nobody would touch this. This Just this, like they wouldn't remake uh, Class of 1984. No, they wouldn't. And, but and this, the funny thing is, I've never seen that movie, Rob. Dude. This Masters movie fucking rules. It's I've so never, good. I've never seen it. This transfer is insane. It, and by the way, it comes in a steel book. I mean, wow. Th this this is so. It was Synapse. Oh, that's not yeah. brought to you by the fine people. That's brought to you by the fine people at Synapse. Check them out today, where you can get the 4K of Blood for Dracula, starring uh, Udo Kier, which is going to be on Let's Get Physical Media tomorrow. But I have to say, if you have this movie, I've wanted, to, I've wanted a good copy of this. Jeffrey, have you seen Massacre at Central High? Oh yeah, yeah, I saw it when I was. It's one of those funny movies where I saw it when I was younger, and kind of like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I, re, I re, when I was younger, I thought it was bloodier than when I rewatched it. I'm like, oh, it's not as bloody hmm. as I remember. No, but it's still watching it like after after Columbine when people just put oh, yeah. bombs in lockers and shit. It's like yeah. wow, yeah. nobody. If you want it, it's like Battle Royale. They keep trying to remake. We're gonna be remake Rattle, yeah. Battle Royale. Yeah, no, you you're can't. not. You're never gonna make that move. No, never not, going not to. here. Never happen. Hey, I've got a que I've got a question for you guys. Uh, and, and one of our, uh, unless we have another super chat to read, Rob. We have lots. Before. We have Clint Baker says also Chris Claremont's X Men is a kick ass documentary on Amazon Prime. I have oh, not yeah. watched that. Yes. Uh, have you, have you yeah, watched I, it? I have seen it. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I've seen a little of it. It's, it. it's interesting. Yeah. But it's one of those, it's one of those like independent documentaries. It's a little dry. It looks, it looks like kind of an expanded special feature. Oh, here, wait. It. Here's, Oh, sorry. <clears throat> no, this that's is it. A... I enjoyed it. Oh, uh, go ahead. Sorry, Rob. Uh, Anthony Gonzalez says, Sup, Metalheads. What film is more disturbing, Deliverance mm. or Cape Fear? Scorsese's remake. Interesting. No, I I, no I, for me, no deliverance. Yeah, I, I do. I think deliverance is way more disturbing. Cape Fear is more of a pulpy genre movie to me. Beautiful movie. I really like. I really like Scorsese's Cape Fear. I do too. But deliverance yeah. is infinitely more disturbing. I would, <clears> um, <throat> hmm. Because again, I grew up in hillbilly country. <laughs> so that was that, that was a day. Yeah. That was it was a documentary for you. For you. It, Squeal it, like a pig was an afternoon for Jeffrey Reddick. No, but it, it so it, it didn't scare me as much. And also it was like, especially when you're from like places like Eastern <laughs> Kentucky, you're, no, you're very mind, you're very mindful of how they portray people from there. Mm. So uh -oh. it was separate for me because it was like, well, they're, they're taking the kind of hillbilly inbred stereotype, like way too far for it to be scary for me. Right. Um, whereas like, fear the remake, you know, especially with Juliet Lewis's performance and so good. just the both of their together, there was for me that was more disturbing because that made me think of like abuse and you know a kind of a predator and and yeah that one disturbed me more. So that makes sense. I'll buy that. Interesting. There, there are there are moments. I mean, obviously the Ileana Douglas uh, oh, scene is dude. really really harrowing. Oh, that's really just harrowing. brutal so brutal. <clears throat> but is it but is it more brutal than ned Beatty? i don't know i just i find i find again and i i come from backwoods vermont 
which could be Deliverance territory too. I just, yeah, I find Deliverance the Deliverance is the more powerful movie. Well, I think I think I would have to say that uh, as the Viceroy of Verisimilitude, I would mm. say that Deliverance has a, a again a reality the same way that Texas Chainsaw does yeah. that makes it so visceral. Whereas, I mean. Cape Fear has Derek Medding's miniature effects. The boat, you know, is oh. a, is it's a miniature. You know, you're, and yeah. you you know it's a. I love it, but you know it's a miniature. The the whole that is much more of a quote unquote movie movie than Deliverance. I mean, Deliverance is like that was a great thing about seventies movies. When you looked at them, you felt like they weren't. They were all docudramas. You were, or, or that you're watching something that actually was happening being filmed. There was I don't know what it is I, I I've been looking to try and how do how do you how do you do that? Yeah, no, yeah, you're, how, you're, how you're, you're absolutely you you are right. It's, it's that's the thing. Cape Fear is so cinematic and has so many like visual tricks in it. That it's are such a movie. It is. It's a brilliant movie though. Yeah. I really think it's it's really great. Um, oh, and Geek of One corrected me. Blood of Dracula, Blood for Dracula is a Severn release, not a synapse. Release. Uh, <clears throat> sorry uh, uh oh uh, uh, i'm just apologizing i'm just pointing my my fuck up there well, that's good I, as I, I, that's as what we I do, do. It, we we don't fear fuck ups we correct ourselves and move forward. but i have a i have a question for you guys someone brought up a question that before you read the the uh the next super chat just to just to bring a little dialogue yeah. uh yeah. they uh, they wanted to know our are the three of us our feelings on death do we do you fear death or do you embrace it are you are you are you afraid of dying and what happens after or are you okay mm. with it jeffrey a, I mean, a simple I, subject yeah, you wrote fine. about death I'm, no i'm not i'm not afraid of dying i just don't want to die in a horrible way <laughs> like with the serial killer or something like that, or, you know, torturing me or something. I'm more afraid of how, how I die. And, you know, I would, I would certainly like to live as long as my mom, because I just feel like I'm just starting to hit my stride in life. So yeah, me too. Um, I, I don't, there's stuff I want to leave behind when I die, but I'm not afraid of death. I mean, I, I personally believe that there's uh, something after, um, but okay. I also don't, I don't fret about it too much either. I try to live in the present. So. Well, I, I, you know, I, I take the Depeche Mode philosophy that death is everywhere. There are flies on the windscreen. If you're a fan of their album Black Celebration, but in all honesty, death is as much a part of life as anything. So the end of life is is um, important. Star Trek, you know, how how you how you treat death is at least as important as how you treat life. I don't fear death. I do. I don't want to die in a horribly painful way. Yeah. You know, I don't want to. Have, but, but I think that death is what gives life its spice. You know, knowing our lives are finite, it's a reminder that, hey, uh, this is going to end, and uh, I want to drink up as much of life as I can. Life is fantastic, and all you people that I haven't met, like I'll tell you today. So today. Um, I we went and saw Tango Shalom, obviously, and I'd never seen a theater. And I threw out the the invitation. Hey, I'm going to be at this theater at uh, 4:20, and uh, a guy who watches John Campia and 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 mostly John Campia, but my show on YouTube came to the screening. Just showed up, oh, and he cool. he'd moved out here to come to LA to work, hopefully in film, and he'd been out here for two weeks. And he, wow. he heard the clarion wow. call. He just showed up. He just showed up. Josh, Josh Valentine uh, is his name. And, and he were talking. I'm like, hey, man, come to dinner with us. So afterwards, after the movie, you know, Josh Valentine moved out to L.A. from, I think, Boston. And we took him with us. And he just kept saying, I can't believe this. I can't believe it. I've been watching on YouTube for a long time. I'm like, I he was like, come on, man. Just join the party. It's all good. I go, this is what happens in L.A. Like when I was in my early 20s, I went, you never knew what happened, what would happen when you would go out at night. And right. and to me, that's what life is. You, you have to drink in life because 
The great thing about life is that it's finite. That's why there's so many stories about vampires and immortality, and they find out that immortality is not what it's cracked up to be. I think that, um, you know, death is not something to be feared. But what do you, do you have a, do you, do you think, Jeff said he thinks there's something after. Do you? I, you know, I do. Because if you look at the, 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 the laws of the universe, do I believe there's a heaven where I get my own condo overlooking the water? No, 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 no I don't no, think that's no. the case. But no, I do think conservation of energy, you know, laws of the universe, we can't even explain consciousness. Well, so, that's the thing. That, okay, so my thing is this. I'm the one that does. I fear death. But why? And, well, hold on. Which makes no sense because I do so many things that will probably bring death upon me quicker. Unhealthy things. Um, <clears throat> That's what she said. I fear it because I, because I don't know what's after. I fear it because I, I've somehow gotten my brain locked into this thing of not uh, of the the fear of the unknown, which has probably plagued me for my entire life, and and that bothers me. And it goes beyond it's it's the selfishness of wanting my consciousness to go on. I if I die. And there's something else. I want to be me. I want to know that it's me and I'm there. Which, but, again, I know that it makes... There's no rational sense about this. I get well, it. No, that makes... I mean, it actually does make sense in a way. I mean, if you're... Because when I go to sleep, I dream. And I'm still... Right, of course. Aware, I, I, I'm still aware that I am dreaming. So that's the part that bothers me. Well, I, I, to add to this question, so Jeffrey, your the the entire what I love the final destination franchise, the idea that fate that we are fated to have a future, and and the the characters thwart that fate, which spins the plot up. Um, what do you think? I mean, obviously, you you talked about doing research before or whatever. Do you do you fear death? No, no. he just said he didn't. Yeah, but um, you know about fate and destiny. I mean, I I think, you know, it's it's you know, I'm cribbing a little bit from the Terminator. I don't think that there is a set in stone life plotted out for everybody. Right. But I do think, but I do think. Like I knew from a very young age that I was going to be involved in the movie business. Like Ugh. there was just, I did know. too. I just there was something that was pull. There were there were things that were there, there are definitely forces or things predetermined that were pulling me to California and and movies. Yeah, for sure. Well, I, and even, you know, even little things like Bob Shea writing me back, like little things that happened to me that led me to new line that led me, you know, so, you know, that was, I wasn't consciously plotting everything. Like when I, I was, I was, I, but I think it was on the right path. Like when I went home and wrote that prequel idea, I'd never written a prequel before. I didn't even know what the, you know, I didn't know how to write a treatment. I was like onion paper and whiting out stuff that was t messed up, but you know, I called information and I got, and so I, I think when you put work out or you put stuff out there, Sometimes it doesn't pay off like you plan it to, but if you're putting it out there with good intention and you're working kind of on your path, it does kind of get, seem easier than when you're fighting against whatever your path is. And that your path does not have to be movies. It doesn't have to be anything. But, you know, I do think that we all have, I think the things that make us all uniquely individual also give us like insights and skills and the way that we think and stuff that, can be you know best utilized in certain fields and you know again i don't think again i never thought i'd be writing movies i just right. knew i was going to be working in the films i um, just i just yeah i just remember being a kid and then looking and and as a kid going what i would love to be able to do as an adult is play with toys 
And then when I saw movies going, oh, there's the equivalent. That's it. Yeah. And and understanding that. So that's what I always wanted to do. Um, yeah. And as far as the de- the death thing goes, it, I mean, it, like, it's such an, an amorphous thing. And I'm all and, and honestly, I'm very envious of people who are very comfortable at the uh, the prospect of death. Um, part of me feels like, oh, well, they've they've reached a they've reached a a a, a emotional level or something that I haven't gotten to at this point. But, but Dave, and, Dave, I mean, you're healthy. Like, 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 look, I mean, death is a part of life. But but you're but yeah. Healthy but the guy. thing Why? is, you, you, healthy. But you could walk across the street and get like creamed by a car, a car, and that's it. You never know. And yeah, it's to me. But, it, but then you it, would never me, know. You'd be gone. But again, but to me, it's 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 not about the actual moment of death. It's what happens after and not knowing. And the thing is, I've worked on so many paranormal shows where I've only had one or two instances of things that. I've seen in the raw footage that I couldn't explain. Wait, you didn't cut those into the show? Well, because they happened when they weren't filming the show proper. All that right. were unexplained moments. So I couldn't, and I showed it to them, and they were like, no, well, we, we can't put it on the show. Well, hang on. Uh, to, to step back a little bit, Mm-hmm. Clark W. Throg's World says, do you think we'll ever see a reprint of the cool Freddy versus Jason versus Ash? And will that be the film project to lure the greatest chin in cinematic history, Bruce Campbell, back into the game? Mm. But, but Bruce Campbell's still in the game. Yeah, aren't they making Maybe. Evil Dead 4 yeah. now? They're making Evil Dead Rise right now, but he is not the star of it. But Bruce Campbell is like working constantly. He's always working, yeah. but he's not doing if he's not doing Evil Dead. No, they're not going to do another. They're not they doing Freddy, Freddy versus do Jason Freddy versus, versus that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I worked. They might the see the reprint of the comic book at some point. Yeah. Yeah. When I worked at New Line, um, that was there was there's another Jeff, Jeff Katz. Who had a similar story yeah. to mine, but in LA, where he reached out to Bob and Bob got him an internship at the company. But I remember he wrote that story um, when they were trying to, right after Freddy versus Jason. And let me tell you, everyone, Jeff Katz is the reason that fucking Kane Hodder isn't in Freddy versus Jason, by the way. Uh oh. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. He was the one who's got, oh, who fucking needs Kane Hodder? We want, I want some sort of Frankenstein guy. That was, look, that's the, that's the guy. That's the re- he is the reason that Kane Hodder is not in Freddy vs. Jason. Oh, I I'm not that. saying he's a bad guy, but I'm saying that you know at that time when he was at New Line and he was an exec and everything else, he made a bad call for the fans. For bad the fans. call, Ripley. A bad the movie call. is still the move. The movie is what it is, and it's still really fun. But you know, Kane deserved it after holding oh, that yeah. torch for so long. Oh yeah. Mm. No, being being absolutely. the uber geek that I am. Yeah. Um. Speaking of that, Stubble McShave says, loss of free will will end autonomy. Uh, a loss of free will and autonomy is much more frightening than death. Being forced to commit acts that goes against your nature is worse, worse than being killed from a storytelling perspective. Mind control, doing things you don't want to know, but you're aware of it. That's scary stuff. Yeah, it sure is. Yeah, it is for sure. That's why I always find Invasion of the Body Snatchers as one of the most terrifying stories ever created. Because the thing is, everyone has to, you know, it's an incredible story because everyone has to sleep. It's the same as Nightmare on Elm Street. Elm Street. Everyone dreams, everyone has to sleep. Yeah, it's one of it's, it's a there, there's it's the one thing. You can't escape from as a human being. Well, you have to sleep at some point. That's why those two movies are <clears throat> so terrifying. Yeah. Because that's there's no movie. there's no escape. Yeah. That's um, one too. That's I agree. Uh, our, our friend Connie Sang, the experiential engagement 
The Sangstress of the, Sound? The Sangstress of Sound. <laughs> the Sangstress of Sound. Connie Sang Connie, you, that- you, 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 Connie, if you're still listening, you can really pick your own name. If you want your own code name. Uh, you you, and, you know, I, I met her briefly, but you can tell she's a smart, witty, vivacious, very cute lady that uh, has a lot to say. But she says, Rob and Dave, I'm ready to party when you are. Ooh. No, really, that's what she wrote. I am ready to party when you are. Oh, I could have. Uh, you know, I'm just going to continue to read what she's saying. Here. I'm ready to party when you are. Jeffrey. Besides your own films, horror films, do you recommend for someone who's terrified of them? P.S. My gaming monitor made it home safe. So, Jeffrey, our our own Connie Sang, the, the what are we calling her, Dave? The Sangstress of Sound. The Sangstress of Sound. So, she works for Harmon, which is a subsidiary of Samsung. And they oversee JBL, and she probably will send you headphones or cool shit she has with. A I'm where I'm using JBL earbuds right now. So you know, it's, I mean that that would probably be a conversation that I'd want to have a little bit with her because I, if, you, <laughs> if you're easy, no, because if you're easily scared, you old smoothie. No, if, but mm. if you're easily scared, um, I w- want to find out what you're afraid of. Like, if some people are like afraid of like demon movies or anything to do with the devil so yeah. i wouldn't recommend anything like that some people are afraid of like real people like me i'm more afraid of real people than i am a fake monster so. i like that some people are afraid of real people like me i mean oh wait no <laughs> yeah no not me nobody's afraid of me i am of yeah i'm kind of afraid I'm of you too ter- i'm terrified to of jeff first of all I, I i know my place around jeffrey i'm terrified oh whatever you guys are just worried what will happen if you get too drunk around me um, no, uh, not really. Uh, oh no, that well, would be fun. Get, I'm sure. You, you're gonna get you gonna get handsy on us, Jeffrey. What's wrong with that? Would I have? To, I, yeah, yeah. No, you'd be jumping on my hand. I'd be trying oh. to beat you off. Um, oh wait! Oh no, wow! No, no I'm gonna beat you off, off of me. Um, oh, 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 oh! Wink, wink, but, uh, nudge, nudge. Back to <laughs> my back goodness. To, back to movies. What I was gonna talk about you know. <laughs> well, never mind. No, it, 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 I mean, if you're afraid. What of kind of tea are you drinking now? <laughs> no, because if you're. If I don't you're have a taste of, of that. Movies, no, if you're afraid of movies, then it's like trying to recommend something that isn't too scary. No, it's true. No, you're you right. Ma- I think you just made her afraid of everything after saying that. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, yes. Uh, I don't think Connie is afraid of anything. As a matter of fact. Jeffrey Reddick, uh, wants, Jeffrey Reddick wants to just. Never mind. All right. No, no. <sighs> Sorry. And now, okay. back to I horror. Always, I, always, I always bring the um, bar down when I when I go on something, especially oh, late at night. Jeffrey, you don't have to apologize. Oh, please Our, me. We don't have a bar. Oh, oh wait. Oh, please me. Oh, Jesus Christ. You know uh, what I'm saying? Who, please, You're Mr. a bad influence. Please? Yeah, come on. There's no bar uh, on the show. Paul was like the West Hollywood horror show. Oh, you don't know. <laughs> oh, if you only knew. Uh, Is that Paul Etheridge? No, it's not. Okay, another Paul. Okay. Paul in Long Beach. I mean, uh, did, did I hear it right? Is Ra- did Rage close? Um, I think so. No, it's somebody bought it. I think Lance Bass bought it. And wow. It was, oh, yeah, it is close because he's going to rename it something. Lansing Bass, I don't know. What I don't know about that. I mean, Lansing what's, Boyle. That's what's the not name? What's the name of the What's the name of the dude who bought who created uh, our favorite um, coffee house slash bar? You know, across across uh, Santa Monica. What? Why am I? Why am I drawing a blank on this? The, you know, the most ex, the most lucrative bar in, in America. Why am I? Oh, I can't. The Abbey. Uh huh. Oh, the Abbey. The Abbey. The Abbey used to be yeah. a coffee house, and now it's just one bundle of fun after another. Yeah. <laughs> why? That place why, will never go. Perhaps away. I should not bring it up, but whatever. It's great oh, no. fun. No, no, no. It's fine. It's, it's fun. The Abbey's yeah, it's fun. fun. It's I fun like for every. It's fun for the whole family. 
Yeah, well, it used to. Yeah, it used to be like one of the premier gay bars, and then um, some straight. Now it's a it. tourist trap. And then they, yeah, they. Is it David Judakin? Is David Judakin owned it? Is that the guy who did it? Who oh, I don't it? remember who owned it. I'm what not, do you eat, Rob? Oh, uh, gummy bears. Um, gummy, Haribo. Gummy, be- gummy bears. Gummy bears. Gummy bears. Gummy bears. Gummy bears. Like, I, in, the, the, like, my, in, yeah. like in Hedwig in the, the Angry Inch. In the gummy Inch. bears. How great is that 4K, by the way? How great? What, 4K? I mean, mean the Criterion the, disc, pardon me. Yes, the Criterion. Yeah. Sorry. Long overdue. It's great. Um, what were, wait, what, what, Lorraine? What? What were we talking what, about? Where are we at? Well, Wait, wait, what? Oh, we, oh, we have, we have. We're talking about Connie Sang in our three way. Oh, oh, yeah. She wants to party with us. This is yeah. awesome. I can't wait. She, I can't. I'm looking to forward party to with it. you guys. That's fine. Whatever. Yeah, but, Jeff, you're, you're, you're always, you know, you're always welcome. No, no. I'll oh. I get a personal invitation. Go ahead. What was the next super chat? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Jeff keeping us online here. <laughs> um, Throg Hetfield says. Throg always changes his name, so every oh, time. Oh, Throg. Oh, Throg. I, I, I play a mean air kitari, all while singing the greatest guitarist of all time, that sexy motherfucker, Prince Rogers Nelson. Yeah, you're right. The greatest rock guitarist ever. Nobody will ever... Uh, I mean, he is the greatest rock guitarist ever. just want to say Prince Rogers Nelson. I agree with you, Throg. Thank you. Uh, Rusty Gecko says, Rob, congrats on the release of Tango Shalom. Jeff, congrats on creating one of the most enduring horror franchises of all time. Is, is, Rusty, is Rusty right, Jeff? Have you? Um, that's what people say. <laughs> um, I, know as if, I know as a fan, I'm very happy with how long it, it's been kind of part of the public zeitgeist yeah is it two that has the the rube goldbergian car crash at the beginning in the mountains no what what no no the car crash no jeffrey jeffrey's pinnacle probably i would say contribution besides creating the franchise is the log log trucks that's it that that's that that sequence is one of the great sequences in film history. That's what I was yeah. talking about. I don't know. I don't know which one it is. If it was two, that's, that's two. One. That's the opening of two. Okay, it is two. Yeah, so I was right. Why are you yeah. making me think? Doubt myself. But you said in the mountains stuff, it was like weird the way you phrased well, okay, it. Okay, it, it, because sir, there's, you fra- there are large sir, you, sir, there are large trees. Sir, it you, looks like it's the Pacific Northwest where I'm from. Sir, oh. you fr- you phrased it weird. Okay, yes, I just might say have. the law. The the log truck sequence. <laughs> okay, you're right. Yeah. You're right. You're right. You're right. That was <laughs> so much of that, that. You know, and some so much of that is um, you know because David again, Ellis, David Ellis, absolutely um, great director. Um, he'd done a lot of stunt work before. Well, he was a huge stunt guy. Oh yeah, yeah so much stunt guy. So much stunt work. So even though we sketched out a little bit of that scene, um, we mm. can't be when he got hired. We're like we're going to let him do his thing with it because we know that whatever Dude. he's going to do is going to turn out better than anything we could write, you know, that um, opening and, sequence. When you, when you saw it for the first time, were you stoked? Yeah. Dude, it's and I wanted, so good. And I wanted <laughs> so to see, because I went into the story for the second one, setting up these four kids, like they were going to be the leads. So I wanted to kind of do a psycho slash nightmare on Elm street slash scream slash every, where you know we think it's going to be oh it's going to be a group of kids again and then you like get rid of all of them <laughs> um right away so it was fun to like watch that with an audience oh Dude, my god that, it's that, so that, it's that, so good it's so it's good orga- it's orgasmic that it, it that really is, is i mean it's, it's so good that 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 opening sequence of two is almost as good as everything in the first movie it's it's just it, it's it's great. It's, it's a, a great, great it's a great. Sequence. It really is great. One of my favorite um, openings. Yeah, I uh, mean, movie. it's one of the it's one of the best movie openings there has Ever. been. Ever. Yeah, 
it's really incredible guys and it's so good came up with and you came up with that and you're talking with us right now and that was from going home to kentucky too like we were trying to think of craig perry who is you know an amazing amazing producer and friend um you know what i we had the story for the second one but he's like yeah the i had the opening set in a the kids go into spring break and they stop in a hotel, stay the night in a hotel, and there's a fire. They use that for a, one of the comic books. But um, he's like, "Yeah, we need something. Like, we just need something different." I was home, going home to better. Kentucky and got behind a log truck and pulled over, and then I pulled off the highway and called him up, and I was like, "What about a fucking log truck on a freeway?" And he's like, "That's it." <laughs> yeah. Well, kudos to you, sir, because that is fucking phenomenal. That scene. And and so good. to be fair, Rob, I I think you thought that it looked like like trees and northwest and everything because it was probably shot in canada well that. but but i'm uh, but but remember i'm from there so so right that, yeah so i'm sure that's the, the why terrain it the and everything around. was yeah it was yes. very much familiar to me it felt like you know i might as well have been going up to go skiing or something i've seen that not that exact same situation but i've seen things close to that so that's you know that's why i said that Sure. So I, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a valid uh, opinion. A valid take is, is what I'm saying. Uh, Little Venus says, so wouldn't or shouldn't the Rocky Horror Picture Show be the highest grossing film in history since it's been played in a cinema for 46 years? Yeah, but it's like only been played one or two cinemas. But what do you guys think? Yeah, like the midnight showings, yeah. Yeah, you get, so, like, what do you think, Rocky Horror? Are you guys fans? Yeah. I, I love too. it. I wouldn't, uh, if I hadn't experienced it in the theater the first time with with the full bells and whistles and the, the toast and the rice and the water and everything, I don't know if I would have appreciated it as much as I do because I got to have that experience, which I don't know how many theaters do get to do that anymore because... There are they some. Seem to be, they seem here. to be so uptight about cleanup and everything else now. Yeah. I don't know if people are getting it, but it's. But I know. But the thing is, I know it still exists because I also know that Darren Bowsman's Repo, the Genetic Opera, still exists in Midnight's now. Uh, these Midnight shows now, the things that have spawned from Rocky are, are really um, impressive and amazing, and and to to. To capture the zeitgeist on a, a specific group is really interesting to me. Yeah, agreed. Um, this is interesting. Uh, Rod Thunderheart says, "Hail R and B, Jeff and Dave. Dave, whatever you fear most has no power over you. It's the fear that has the power. No question there. Just a statement. What do you think, Dave?" Fear has no power over me. Well, uh, yeah, it does. I, I think it does. Whatever yeah, you fear the most off. has no power over you. It's the fear that has the power. Uh, well, what yeah, you fear, fear most, fear but has... it's the fear of that that has the power. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Interesting question, though. It is. Rod Thunderheart, that's a good one. That's why I like this community. They ask good questions. Yeah. To the point where I need to think about it a little bit. Jeff, take it away. Oh, oh God, I was going to sing something ridiculous, but then I, couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't think something ridiculous and I can't sing, so I'm just saving everybody from all that. Um, well, I, I think, look, I think you should just randomly break out in a song. If you feel that way, please no. do so. <laughs> um, Rob, what uh, do you think? What do you think? You didn't answer the question. Well, I mean, I, I look to me, my whole uh, life is based on trying to make stuff. I want to make things. I mean, I want to make future films, but you know, I, I, as a matter of fact, I did. And it's in the theaters. It's in the theaters now. It's expanding next weekend. But what's, um, that's what floats my boat is making stuff. Making anything. I don't care what it is, but I love making things like with collaborators, watching great talented people do things that accentuate what you want to make is always great. 
that's my desire in life. That's what I like to do is just make things. So, Rob, let me ask you this, though. Okay, in a world where Dave Parker is going to ask me. And, I, I, and, and yes. guys, since since we're coming up to the 3 o'clock hour, and I think we should wrap this up, and I, I, I want to wrap I agree. I got to go to bed soon. We got, I got and, shows and to I, do. I, and, and Jeffrey, you've been so gracious to be here this long. No, no. I'm, thanks for having me. Please. Really appreciate it. Anytime two guys ask me to do something till three o'clock in the morning, I'm like, sure. <laughs> yeah, but now I feel we've <laughs> let you down because, like, I feel the same way. And yeah. uh, it no, could have been a lot. Not sure. I, I'm not sure if Jeffrey got off yet, but um, <laughs> so you, mean off this, the, you mean off the show? No, no. But maybe this question, Rob, will get him off. Rob, I've never asked you this. Off the show? Okay, go ahead, Dave. Uh, uh, Ask me the question. Since before your sun burned hot in the sky, I have awaited a question. That's from the Star Trek episode City on the Edge of Forever. Just By Harlan saying. Nelson? Yes. 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 So what question do you have for me, Dave? Rob, what are you afraid of? Deep down. Oh, uh, well, in your I, soul. I, I don't have an answer for that. My greatest fear is the lack of civility. And and what I mean by that is is if our society descends into a Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome or Fury Road situation where, where warlords take over and if you're not good enough or smart enough, you're put to death. You know, the, all of... All of the things that I hold dear about civilization will be swept away. That scares me. Because wow. I think I, I like our civilization, despite the problems it had getting to where it's at now. Everything was getting better. And I feel, I feel now we live in such a, a culture, it's very difficult. It's very disheartening. Good answer. So I'm scared. Good answer. Dave. Well, thank you. Good answer. Good answer. Survey says. I don't Ding. know. I don't know. I, Ask I, I like this. People say, no, uh, no. It was just that, that, the same question was just for you. Okay. It was just for you. I Rob. gave you an was, honest answer. I did. No, I know. It's great. It's great. Uh, and people are going, you seem fearless. I like that. Oh, I go like ahead, that. Dave. That's a, that, a good way to wrap this up venture further into the unknown don't be afraid of the unknown is what i'm getting from this discussion tonight and oh. and jeff with final destination is maybe the final destination isn't the final, our final destination our yeah. final destination we don't know where that is agreed i think you know someone said i think rob's fears are canceled hot toys I think you might be right there. <laughs> no, 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 no. My, my my biggest fear is loss of civility. I mean, I'm a big fan of what human beings have been able to accomplish since we crawled out of the muck. And and the, this talk about 9-11, which is coming up. One of the scariest things, Dave, I've seen in my entire life. Here's my problem with so much of the modern thinking. They want to mm -hmm. burn the world down, but yet not offer an alternative. You know, like so it's give like, me something it's like, else to believe in. If you so want to blow like the Alfred, world trade, so it's like it's like Alfred said. Some people just want to watch the world. That's burn. exactly right, and and I don't uh, subscribe to that. And I want to see the characters succeed and all that. But I, I just, I, I do believe in civility, in in civilization, in Western culture. One of the great things about what we've done over the last. The great thing about the West is that we believe in the sovereign individual uh, individuality of each and every person. And every person needs to have that right protected to be who and what they are. Like we, 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 and, and there's a lot of people that don't want you to be who and what you are. We've seen it in Texas. Our Supreme Court has upheld that ridiculous. Look, I'm, a, I'm adopted. I was this close to never existing. I know this. If there were those laws that existed in in Texas now, 
uh, my biological mother would have fled somewhere where she could have had the procedure done if she wanted to. So I just think we need to be mindful of one another. You know, I, I say on the show, Dave, all the time, in the entire cosmic infinitude of the universe, there's only one of each of us. Sure, unless you're a twin, but you're still different. There's only one of us. So that means you and I, everybody, is the rarest mineral in the universe. And why squander that? I don't know. Uh, I, I can't think of a better way to end it. That was a, a incredible, beautiful thought to leave people thinking about tonight and over this long holiday weekend. Mm. I hope everyone enjoys it. I hope they get to go and do things, revel in it, enjoy this long weekend uh, that we have, but at least the ones in, in America, because we do have people who are in many countries. Like, yes. Luckily, watching, watching, watching you, watching me and, and, and Jeff. Jeff, but let's leave it. Let, let, uh, well, Can I ask one. Jeff one last question? Because I want to give him the final word. Yes. Yeah, I want and I want Jeff let people know also where they can find you and interact with you if they want to know more yeah. about you and and talk with you. Okay, and then and then he'll leave you with oh. his final. And then Rob will ask yeah. you so you can leave us no pressure but you're you're the final word on tonight's show. Okay. Well, the best best way to follow me is on Twitter or Instagram, uh, Jeffrey A Reddick. Uh, yeah, that's the best way to follow me. And, um, I post stuff. I like to share my friend stuff. I like to interact as much as I can. You know, I obviously had a lot more free time during COVID lockdown than I do now. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not on the social media as much as, you know, I used to be, but that's, I, I do love interacting and I, you know, send me all the log truck memes you have. Like uh, every <laughs> time I see, I get them, I, I chuckle. Um, and it makes me smile. So, and he gets at least five cents each time. So, <laughs> I wish. Uh, what, <laughs> what, was, you what was your question, Rob? Jeffrey, my question to you is this: um, If you if you think about the modern state of horror and horror cinema, how do you feel about where we're at? And do you feel that there's more innovation to be made in the horror genre, especially on film? I think there's always more innovation to be made. I mean, again, I think as the technology advances and more people have access to it, we're going to hear fresh stories and fresh perspectives that we haven't heard before. Uh, you see a movie like Hereditary, you know, yeah. which was definitely the work of an auteur uh, filmmaker and a hard to sit through more than once because it's so, so um, heavy, but it's a work of art. So you're always going to, have the works of art. You're also going to have the great popcorn entertainment, which are still works of art. Um, and I think as long as new people are being born and being creative, hmm. we're going to always continue to get new variations on old ancient stories that have been passed down for millions of years. So um, I'm excited, you know, optimistic. You'd say I'm always optimistic. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that's good to hear. I feel the same way. What about you, Dave? Hold on. I'm, uh, I'll say this. Um, we are very lucky. We're very privileged in the sense that one, we, we have, uh, well, one, I'm very thankful to you because it is, uh, you've created a platform where we have the opportunity to express our thoughts and hopefully like connect with people who think like-mindedly. Yeah, um, I think or, we do. Or, and, and the other thing is, if if they differ, we are at least uh, able to look at their stuff, consider it, and admit if we're wrong. Um, Us I love the fact that... Wrong? I, yeah. I mean, look, we're all... It's, it's the potential of all of us to be wrong, I think. But, uh, but what I'm... What I'm thankful for with this is the fact that um we get to talk to people from around the world uh and and hear different opinions and 
and I know you and I get you know very loose at times, and 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 yeah, but I agree with you. I mean, I agree with what you're saying. It's, it, you know, it's midnight metal, and 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 a lot of the time, you know, sometimes it's just a party, and sometimes we get into these deeper things. And yeah, what I've really enjoyed about doing this is the fact that, um, and I'm thankful of being able to do that and express certain ideas and, and, and even like go off on tangents where I'm completely forgetting the original question that was asked, <laughs> which someone is pointing out right now on me. It's like Dave is answering a different question, but that's okay. Yes, I know. Uh, it's late guys. It's 3am. It I've, is. Ha- I've had a couple cocktails. Not that many. We're like Rob and I were really good tonight. We really were good tonight where we're not like, no, passing out on camera or anything else do i do um that? what one bathroom break tonight that's pretty fucking good for for me well I, I i think we'd be remiss i want to thank jeffrey reddick for being here i mean the creator of the final destination franchise it's great to have you here sir everyone oh, should you. should look at your films and tell people first of all where can people find you on social media and what would you like them of all the work you've done what do you think they should look at first Oh, that's a tough one. Um, again, yeah, the Twitter, the Twitter and the Instagram, just to make myself sound like I'm old, even though I'm young at heart. I'm going to call it the Twitter. The Twitter. The Twitter. That Twitter Not the Facebook. Little, it sounds good, little, like the Twitter. Yeah, the Facebook's the twi- for older. The Twitter. Um, I will, I will, you know, the Final Destinations, I think, are, are really fun. But one of my favorite, even though they watered it down a lot, uh, Lionsgate watered it down. Or, no, the producers watered it down. We were going to get a theatrical from Lionsgate, but I really enjoy Tamara, which mm. is kind of my my homage to Carrie. Yeah, of um, course. And I, it's just it's the the movie that I have the most fun with, um, mm. because I wrote it for myself. After people kept saying write something like Final Destination, I was like, you know, fuck it, I want to write something that right. I like and I love Carrie, but I wish that she got to telekinetically slaughter people much earlier in their film. So, um, and you know, Jenna Dewan has some great kind of snippy, like, Oh, I can't believe she just said that dialogue and, Mm. uh, love the cast in that film and, uh, just think it's a lot of fun. So I would, I would say kind of maybe watch that one. If you were, if you were starting off on the Jeff Reddick, it's good. uh, Refresh. Of course. The Jeff Reddick love train. (laughs) Uh, Riding on it. It's going to be a long, long ride. But, Roller um, coaster but, um, of love. Yeah, but one of the animated cartoons <laughs> I worked on uh, called A Tale Dark and Grim is going to be out on Netflix um, for Halloween. Oh, nice. Congratulations. Um, so you get oh, yeah. Watch. Oh, wait. And you, you also wrote on this other uh, animated show that's coming out soon. What's that called? Samurai Rabbit, the Usagi Chronicles. Yeah, isn't that based on something big? Yeah, I think um, this comic book called Usagi Ojimbo. It's a spinoff. Just, just saying. Yeah, Mister, Mister, Mister Humble. I think, um, yeah, somebody cool's executive producing that too. Um, oh uh, yeah, James, James Wan. Oh, Cruz. nice. Yeah, so never heard I'm of. I'm really, I'm really excited and, and was blessed to the showrunners from the Grimm uh, car- cartoon asked me to come over and work on that show as well. So, hmm. um, it was a really I mean, always again horror, horror at heart. But um, it was really nice to kind of work in the animation because I love comic books and cartoons too. So that's that's been really fun to work on. So I like that. You either watch murder, murder Jeffrey, or kid friendly Jeffrey. You get you get your options. It's like <laughs> Jeffrey Re- Jeffrey Reddick, horror at heart, but horror at pocketbook. I want <laughs> I want mur- murder Jeffrey. Murder and I book. wish I was. I wish I could be more like that. <laughs> Someone awesome. wants the Jeffrey Reddick West Hollywood Horror Show. Ooh, the West Hollywood Horror Show. I think we need <laughs> that's to on a nightly basis. Own though. Fucking show. You don't ever make a movie that, about it. That's definitely that's definitely a uh, Jeffrey that's Reddick show. That's my next slasher movie. The West Hollywood <laughs> Horror Show. Midnight's tonight. <laughs> well, gentlemen, what do you think? Yes, yes, Thank we you should so call much it. For having me. Um, Thank you. And thanks for all the the people who stayed up this. Because I'm sure it's we've got so many time time zones that um oh my god either got up early staying up late uh, really appreciate it so um everybody have a great Labor Day weekend and a great rest of the year too 
Have well, thanks for your metal. time, sir. It was great to have you. A real honor. <laughs> have a fucking, fucking metal fucking weekend, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. Take care. Everyone, everyone who, who chimed watched. in. <laughs> who watched. Oh, yeah, that. That, too. Yeah, who watched. Yeah. yeah. Listened. Uh, participated. Uh, gave Rob an ego boost. Whatever it is. Hell, yeah. Hell, yeah. Thank you all. Thank awesome. you all. All right. All right, Jeffrey, I will see you. Thank you so much for coming.